Good morning, everyone. So glad to see everyone back together and in the building. It's good to see your faces. And those that are on, online on Zoom, thank you for joining us and welcome. Glad to have you as well. Um, we are going to do our work session today, and Ms. Stacy Smith is going to lead us through this. Good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Um, so Dan's going to pull up the presentation. Um, and I'm going to just kind of quickly outline kind of how we have the, the morning organized, and we can switch it or change it up at any time, okay? Um, we have a really quick presentation um, that we're going to spend 10, 15 minutes on max, um, and then hopefully jump directly into looking at specific applications, and we have those districts on the Zoom with us, so you can ask questions. So the four districts that we specifically have pulled their applications and asked them to be on today, one is Westside with Johnson County, and they have partnered with Guy Fender Co-op as a consortium. We have Truman, we have Texarkana, who has partnered with Virtual Arkansas as a partner, um, and then we have Rogers School District, so those are four that we have on. Also on the Zoom, we have most of the cooperative directors um, on the Zoom because a lot of them, th those that have set up consortiums, so if at some point we wanna get into more questions around that, they're on the Zoom to answer questions, and Virtual Arkansas is also on the Zoom and can go in more depth about if you have questions about just how is digital learning set up, um, you know, what is, what is the content early versus teacher, like, and what are the caps, so it allows you some direct contact with asking questions around that. Um, so that's kind of how we have it set up. Um, kind of towards the end, um, you know, making sure we go back and clarify any questions around waivers. We want to make sure that everybody's clear on that today. Um, having a discussion around possibly the number of years that we're approving for and what that looks like and what it means and, and just having a discussion for that. And again, if you wanted to go deeper into virtual Arkansas or the consortiums, those folks are here too. Okay, anybody have a suggestion or are we okay with kind of how that's framed? Okay. So very quickly kind of hitting this, there are, at this moment we have um, 152 total plans submitted, okay? That's a combination of districts and charters. And we had charter panel this week, and the same experience that you had at State Board last week where you felt you just had lots of questions, they had the exact same thing, okay? So um, for us, it's a moment to step back and reflect. You really need to hear from the schools. And so hopefully we're gonna try to provide that for you today and give you a little bit more of a framework. So they experienced the same, the same thing. Um, so that kind of gives you just an overview. What I want you to know from the department, because these are 1240 waivers, in the past, we've worked with people on their 1240 waivers, they've come to the board, but we've really left the responsibility on the districts to explain to the board what it is they're asking for and what they're doing, okay? On this, with digital applications, the department has tried to put a process in place to ask all the possible questions that you might ask if we were bringing them forward, and we set the application up that way. Okay, so that's what's different about this time, is we tried to get and brainstorm all the different things that we thought needed to be known ahead of time. So that's the difference piece, all right, as far as the 1240s from past to present. Um, here are the list of cooperatives around the state that actually are having consortiums and working with their district. Again, we've got Guy Fincher on today who will partner up with Westside when they talk about their school and their application. Um, and I believe Kathy Swan is on who can talk about the, all the consortiums um, throughout the state at the end if you'd like her to. Virtual Arkansas usage, I know there was lots of questions around that and again, Don will kind of tell a little bit about Virtual Arkansas and our partnership with them. Um, about 40% of the applications you're reviewing, seventh through 12th grade, are actually utilizing Virtual Arkansas. Okay, 10% of the ninth through 12th graders, or ninth through 12th applications um, are using Virtual Arkansas. The reason why you see some more at the middle schools, Virtual Arkansas is one of the vendors who does provide content um, for middle school grades. Um, overview of the waivers, Mary Claire. I'm going to let you kind of come up for this. I know I think your next slide is you too. Mm -hmm. uh, on this one, just the number of waivers percentage, you can see 83% of the applications that we're reviewing are asking for that attendance waiver. Only about 34% are asking for the cl class size, 28% for teaching load, 90% are asking for that six hour instructional day, clock hours at 81%, and 
and then recess at 66. And then I'm gonna let Mary Claire talk you through a little bit more about the specific waivers. And on the class size and teaching load numbers here, these are actually a little bit higher than um, the actual percentages because as we went back through and we were preparing, there are some schools that had requested class size and teaching load when they didn't need them, and so we've shored that up on their end. So this is actually a little bit high. So, and Dr. Hill, for the board members that are on the Zoom, you should have received a, a PDF that has a bunch of different charts on it. This is one of the charts that's on. Um, on that. I believe it's chart one, but because the screen sharing thing is at the top, I can't be sure. Um, I think it is chart, well, sorry. sorry. Chart, chart two. two. Chart two, thanks. Thank you, everyone. So this is just kind of a chart that kind of explains in which situation schools would need waivers. So for attendance, the need is pretty much the same, no matter if they're doing a blended, hybrid, virtual asynchronous, or virtual synchronous program. Because the law requires that a teacher take attendance and that attendance be taken daily. If a learning system is gonna be taking attendance or if they're gonna be doing attendance based on how many times they log into a system or um, they're allowed to work on days on the weekend or they don't have to work every day because it's asynchronous, they'll need a waiver of that attendance piece. It's the same for all of them. Class size is treated a little bit differently so for a blended or hybrid program, if it is talking about K-4 class size, they will always need a waiver if they're trying to go over class size. If we're talking about five through 12, they will need a waiver if the courses are not 100% virtual. So if you have some kids in person and some kids virtually, you're gonna have to have a waiver to go over class size. If it's an in-person course in five through 12, you would have to have a waiver to go over class size unless it is a large group instruction course, which is described on chart three. In the virtual, fully virtual programs, the class size waivers are pretty much the same. You still would need a waiver to go over K-4 class size, and class size does not apply to 100% virtual courses in 512. Now, if in grades five and six, they are in a self-contained elementary model as opposed to a middle school model, that changes things just a little bit and we treat them like K-4. So grades five and six, it kind of depends on if they're a self-contained elementary or a middle school model. Um, on teaching load, um, if it is any type of blended or hybrid where a teacher is teaching in person and virtually, they will need a waiver of teaching load um, unless it is a large group instruction course. Um, and again, on chart three, which we'll do here in a little while, we'll go through class size and teaching load and large group instruction and how all that plays together. Um, in the virtual options, if a teacher is teaching 100% virtually, no waiver is needed of teaching load. And I think this is a good time to clarify that a teacher can always agree to teach over 150 students per day. They just must receive additional compensation. So when we're talking about granting waivers for teaching load, we're just really talking about waiving additional compensation. And some of the applications will be laid out with different waiver compensation. Some of them will be laid out with additional waiver compensation. So we will have to see what it is. But in all ways, in every situation, it's still over. Mary Claire, I hate to interrupt you. We can't hear you on Zoom. Test mark, please. Did the batteries on the back?
Testing. Testing. I can hear you. It's been a audio week. Can hear yeah, me yeah, now? Yeah. Yes. What part? Did you not hear anything I said? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, for me, I think we lost you. You were still talking about we were on um, teaching teaching load. It's okay. kind of where the audio cut out. Perfect. We don't have to start from the beginning. I, these people in this room were going to boo me off stage if I kept talking. Um, so in teaching load, um, if it is a virtual program, if the teacher is teaching 100% virtually, meaning they don't have any in-person students at all, no waiver of teaching load is needed because that's actually allowed. And on page four of the document that I sent out, I've put citations to the rules, and if you're in person, I printed out a copy of the rules also, and you have that so you can see it. Um, if you're on the Zoom, you can find those on our website, or I'll send you a copy here in a minute. Um, so if the teacher is teaching bo both virtually and in person, a waiver would be necessary to allow them to go over 150 students without additional compensation. And again, those five and sixth grade students are treated differently depending on the model of those grades. Um, the six hour instructional day, a waiver will always be necessary in a 100% virtual program because there's not usually a set instructional day because you have asynchronous pieces even if you're having synchronous pieces. Um, in clock hours, um, in both of the virtual pieces, if the high school courses are not meeting for 120 clock hours, which usually in a virtual setting they're not, they'll need a waiver to award credit for those courses. Um, and then lastly, recess, which only applies to elementary school, so we're talking about K-4 and 5 and 6 if they're in a self-contained elementary model. Um, in a virtual setting, 100%, the waiver is necessary unless the school is requiring some sort of proof that the student has participated in those minutes of recess, which I think gets really tricky. Um, in a blended and hybrid model, it just depends on whether they're providing the 40 minutes of instructional time when the students are at school. So as we go through the four applications today, I'll get up and kind of talk a little bit about their waivers and why they're asking for them. And then at the end, we'll go through um, some of the other charts that I provided. But if you have questions on the charts as we're going, please feel free to ask. Absolutely. Mary Claire's pretty good, isn't she? Now, I will tell you, she wanted us to start with theme music today. Her, Dr. Pride. I think Dawn, and they were like, ready to rumble, and I'm like, absolutely not appropriate, ladies and gentlemen. So. Um, okay, so um, kind of going back through here, let me get this, no, we're not working now, but remote's not working, Dan. No, it's not the, it's this. That's okay. I'm gonna keep, you're fine, I'm gonna keep talking um, because we're almost done with this part and we'll get straight into the schools, which is the part that I think we really okay. wanna jump to quickly. Um, so again, over, application overview on your application. We talked about the instruction or delivery mode, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and you can kind of see the percentage there of the applications that have come in, what they're falling to. So about 67% are synchronous, happening at the same time. 95% have an asynchronous um, mode to it. 31%, um, and you've got multiple grades, multiple, that's why you see the percentages being different, okay? Um, student action required, 31% of the applications require, 31% of them require daily interaction where 80% were weekly. And again, you got overlaps depending on grade levels, all right? Um, teacher role there, um, in elementary, we see 10% of those that are doing dual in class and virtual. 23% um, of those, so it increases a little bit with secondary that have those dual roles, all right? 
check-ins, 26% of the applications talk about teachers checking in daily with kids, 76% have a check-in for weekly. And again, those were specific questions districts had to answer because we felt like that was important. We wanted to know that you couldn't just go through a whole semester and nobody check on you, okay? Um, on the, the right side there, you can see the um, different questions and feedback that was provided a lot around that application in that area on questions that we really needed the schools to answer. Um, we felt like science of reading was gonna come up, especially in the elementary grades. And on some of the applications you'll hear about today, those were still concerns for us. It's always been a concern for us um, with how does the curriculum align there, especially in a digital platform, and especially that face-to-face -face instruction with our primary students. And so um, there are some applications that are gonna be a higher risk, and we're gonna monitor and make sure how is the district making sure that progress is being made. And you'll hear about that today. Technology, again, that was another section of the application, and you can kind of see the digital content piece there. We're seeing about 14% of them being teacher-created content on their platforms, 69% being a provider providing the content, which again makes a difference for the amount of students you could probably teach, okay? 16% um, of them are showing some type of combination. Student supports. The focus areas there, I wanted you really to kind of see that list. Questions specific about wellness, safety, student engagement, response intervention, formative assessment, dyslexia, GT, ESL, special education accommodations. Those were specific areas that we asked questions around to make sure those services were being provided. Um, because there were things that we heard, especially around dyslexia and special education this past year about services. So again, that's something we wanted to make sure the districts had thought through. Um, teacher supports, again, um, how many had extra planning time, what were we seeing there, content instructional supports, um, what was the class size and teaching load. So one thing that I think has been a, a point of confusion has been that whole class size and teaching load and what you have to ask for and what you don't have to ask for. And you got to this point where if you're 100% virtual, you know, that class size piece or teaching load piece is, is you don't need it, but that's still part of the application because it's still something we want to know. Just because you don't have to have a waiver, is it a still a good digital application? And so those questions are still on there for you to look at. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move us to the school districts. I will say every application, district application that's come through, Tally, correct me if I'm wrong, um, no one has made it through on the first round. Every single application has had to have feedback that we've gone back and said we need clarification on these points, is that correct? Um, and so there's been this back and forth for a final application. And so what you have is the final application for these four districts today. So um, I'm just gonna double check that if is West Side on? I know Roy is on. Stacey, I do have some questions. Yes. If you don't mind. This is Sarah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Moore. I ask you all, you and Mary Claire now before we get to the districts. Um, this was super helpful. The, chart that Mary Claire sent. Thank you so much. I am still held up on the idea of large group instruction and having no limits on that five through 12. This is something that comes, and I know we talked, but this is something that comes in rule. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and at the point in time this was put in rule, what was the discussion, what did that discussion look like? And what were the leading factors that lead us to believe that virtual teachers can have, you know, very large class sizes? So it's my understanding that large group instruction has existed in the standards for accreditation for quite some time. The class size and teaching load rules are newer because we, in 2018 when we revised the standards and did that big overhaul, we pulled them out into their own rule. But before that, large group instruction existed in the standards for accreditation as part of class size. And I believe that the reason was when you have teachers who are teaching courses that are necessarily going to be big, like choir, JROTC, advisory periods, um, performing arts courses, and virtual courses, um, that allowing them to have additional compensation for teaching over the 150 um, created an advantage to teaching those courses over teaching the core courses where 
you were going to have a class size that was smaller and not get to the 150. And of course, if I'm saying something that somebody um, wants to jump in, please feel free. Um, but so if you have a teacher who's teaching 20 students a day for 30 students a day for a couple of periods, and then you have a band teacher who teaches band three times a day and their band class has 100 students in it, um, they would be getting additional compensation for 150 students for teaching three sections of band throughout the day, um, where the intent of large group and, or additional pay for teaching load was really you're going above and beyond what would already be required for um, that particular course and class. And that makes sense absolutely for those courses. My, I think I'm still just held up on the digital part of it. And what is our operating theory that digital teachers, virtual teachers can have that big class size when we're hearing that only 31% of districts have daily interaction. You know, you'd have 300 because we're not requiring that daily interaction. I'm held up on that. Um, since this is a workshop session, are you okay if I ask um, Kathy Swan or John Ashworth, um, who- Yeah, and it might be better to get to them. I think I just wanted to hear sort of uh, background well, on yeah. allowing virtual to be large group instruction. Right, so um, Kathy Swan um, years ago helped start Virtual Arkansas and Team Digital when it was really truly innovation and one of the first states to kind of do that and so i know that she's on she might have some insight on virtual instruction and class size and then john actually over the virtual arkansas can speak directly to how many students their classes are so do you want to do that now or do you want to hear from the district or do you want to do that we at can the do end? districts and then when we get to them we can do it okay fine so is that okay with everybody okay um, so Kathy and John, I'm going to cue you up at the end to come back to that. So if you'll both be ready for that, is West Side on? I know he was getting on. Okay, so we're going to skip to Truman. I, I don't see him yet. He's supposed to be getting on right now. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and skip to Truman. The second application that you have, Sally, you want to come up and talk about Truman? He's on now. Oh, he's on now. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tally Hart. I'm with the Department of Ed, and I'm here to uh, talk to you guys about Truman School District. They um, were actually the very first district to submit their application through Insights and went through several rounds of revisions from the various teams and the feedback that was shared with them. Um, <clears throat> we did, um, in, the, in the end, even though we did accept their plan, we did have some uh, concerns, especially regarding the K2 piece and ensuring that they are meeting the science of reading requirements. And they submitted some further information to us via email on how those um, concerns were going to be met. Um, they did have, um, they did apply for the waivers for class size and teaching load. <clears throat> and in those applications, they put class size was 100 and teaching load was 250. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Miss Mary Claire come up and talk to you a little bit about um, how that works and what that looks like for their virtual program. And I know that Miss Brandy Williams from the superintendent from the district is also on to answer any questions you may have for her. I, I'm Brandy Williams and I will say I've emailed since then to say that we really do not it's a, this is a living document that's what I'm going to say or a living uh, option for families and uh, for us we had started a quasi version of this the year before COVID came and we called it Truman Virtual Academy it's really just an entity within our school district but it started out with trying to meet the needs of learners and expulsion that's really where it started and then a couple of medical needs that were happening and it was kind of a spin-off of 504 plans that really needed to be addressed and so when COVID came, we had learned a lot of lessons. We had been using Lincoln Learning um, as a major part of that platform, but some virtual Arkansas and some blended type things. And so we really had learned a lot of lessons in a really small group of kids the year before. And so I'm going to say we had a pretty good plan going into COVID. We were thankful for those experiences. And one of the main pieces was that we assigned a liaison to every student that was a certified teacher and they were checking on those students every day. And they were the ones who were meeting with parents and kids and looking at their grades and seeing what assessments they needed. 
and uh, and that changed everything for us during COVID. And so at the height of COVID, we had hundreds of kids wanting to do virtual like every school probably. And, and then with that accountability piece though, parents started bringing kids back because we were checking on their grades and their instruction and their assignments and are you submitting those and all that stuff. And we wanted them on site. We, you know, you had to take your STAR test, you had to come take your interim test, and, you know, whatever it was going on. Um, but it also, I mean, this is a, um, and I'm sitting at the high school, our digital liaison who's been in charge of this the whole time, our head one is in this room with me. I just don't want to have our faces at weird angles here. But, um, but anyway, and so we're in a school if you hear these announcements going off. Uh, but anyways, from the beginning, we're in a pretty high need area. Our poverty is pretty high. And I'm sure y'all know that um, looking at our statistics, but with this has come so much more clarity on needs of families. And it is so much bigger than COVID. There are families who are very terrified of COVID. We were talking about one this morning that Ms. Hall well, was in a meeting with this family talking about possibly next year. And their dad worked in the morgue during the height of COVID at a hospital. So their outlook on this is very different than a different student that we had who's really dealing with a lot of anxiety and their mental health therapist saying well, they really need virtual schooling and so every case has been so different and what we've learned with the liaison piece is we treat every student almost like an IEP where it's an individual child and we're shaping their day based on their needs and their needs are changing their needs change from the beginning of this year to right now and even looking to next year and so when we wrote this plan I'm going to say this is really difficult and Miss Hall and I hate that you can't see her face. I want you to at least see her over here. Uh, she and I really looked at this like what will this look like next year and since I submitted the plan the first time we've gone through some revisions. It's changed in this last week when vaccines came out for kids 12 and older. There's family who's already changed their minds and if it comes out for vaccines kids under 12, it's going to change a few more minds. And, uh, and so with that, we know that it has to be every single child and what is it that they need. And we are having, I mean, it's a big team, counselors, principals, teachers, their SPED teachers, dyslexia, whoever are all in these meetings, sometimes virtual, sometimes face-to-face, -face, depending on what the family desires. And we're talking through it and we're looking at data and we're having hard conversations, but supportive conversations. And so when we first applied, and I'm going to say, I right now don't need class size waivers or teaching load waivers. I don't need those right now. I don't mind it for those to be taken off. The only reason why I that they're on there really right now is I don't know what next fall is going to look like. My fear is, is that the flu season is going to come back and parents are immediately going to think it's COVID again and they're going to want a lot of virtual and I want to be prepared. I don't have large numbers right now when we have about 150 right now who are in virtual who are wanting to finish the year and next year we have about 25 now it was 100 two months ago they're like i really think we're going to want to do it now as vaccines have come on we've had more conversations we pulled all the data again now they're like they need to come back to school you know we're more comfortable with this vaccines are a big game changer and so um now we have a probably a solid 25 kids that's not very many but the the philosophy stays the same for us and it's every kid looking at them as an individual and y'all I can sit here and tell you sad stories all day long but they're real stories and probably the one that stuck with me the most is we've also delivered meals every Monday five breakfast five lunch to every house to every kid in virtual and so that's been a big undertaking but we've done it and uh, one day we went to a child's house who was struggling some and their house was gone their literal house, they were living in a house trailer and it was repossessed the night before. The family was gone. And had we not been doing virtual and had we not been delivering meals to houses, we would have never known that that had happened. And so there have been some stories of kids who are high flyers and they're, you know, they're involved in JO teams and AAU basketball and they're working on their, you know, work in the evenings and that kind of thing. But those numbers are a lot smaller than those kids of high need. And a lot of families, it's allowed us to really, really connect with them like never before. Um, Ms. Hall said, I have learned more this year, <laughs> probably have, in her whole 20 something years of teaching because we are using all the resources all the time. The social workers, the mental health, the counselors, the special education, dyslexia, you know, family services, what do you need? They need a ride to get this or that. All those things have been encompassed in this work this year. And uh, so for us with class size and teaching load, 
I had emailed in and said, I really don't need that waiver anymore. I don't. But at the same time, it has been working for us this year because of the way we do it. A lot of the, if it's anything that would put something on a teacher, extra work, they're going to get paid for that. And it would be, you know, that overage. But most of the classes that we were talking about are classes where they're working solely online. There's not any interaction with that classroom teacher. It's the liaison. We put that in our plan. They would have a certified teacher assigned as their liaison checking on anything they need. Um, they can come to school at any time, all those types of things. And so our numbers were larger when we wrote that initially, and we don't need that right now. I feel like the waivers that we do have is out of complete transparency. And may, and I am detail oriented. I admit that's probably a, a double-edged sword for me in life, but like the six hour instructional day, we assign that much work. There's that much opportunity for learning. Do they spend six hours on it? I, I don't know. I'm not at home with them per se. And so they, some students this year, we know are spending a lot longer and some students are spending less time. And so those are things that are full transparency. That's why we ask for those waivers. Same thing with clock hours. I don't know if they're spending 120 clock hours. They may be spending a lot more. They may be spending less. Some students worked this year in very unconventional ways and they got all their work done on Tuesday, Thursday when mom and dad was home because they have a weird work schedule. And then on Saturday and Sunday, they, they were catching up. And some kids got up every morning at eight o'clock and worked till three with their parent because that's the support system they had. And so we have worked on that in these committees with parents to set up their work schedule. And so they're not all a six hour instructional day, five days a week. Ms. Williams, for, I'm gonna let Mary Claire jump in and talk specific about your waivers real quick. And then we'll okay. see if they have a specific question for you. Thank you. So Ms. Williams has done a good job kind of providing you an overview. So just quickly, I'll tell you, the, the purpose of the attendance waiver, like we talked about, is since um, they have some asynchronous pieces, they, the teacher may not be seeing that student every day and noting attendance every day, so that's why they need the attendance waiver. Um, for the six-hour instructional day, again, if you have asynchronous pieces, you're not offering a full six-hour instructional day. Even if you are offering six hours of work or six hours of videos, it's not a set six hour instructional day. So that's the purpose of that. And clock hours, the same thing. If you have an asynchronous piece, that student might not meet with a class for 120 clock hours, even if they're doing 120 clock hours worth of work. So those are the, uh, and then the last one they've asked for is recess. And again, that's because since the students are virtual, there's not really a good way to ensure that every day the student's getting 40 minutes of structured and unstructured social time for recess. Although I know most of the applications have included recommendations for that or have embedded pieces of that in courses. Um, so everyone's doing it a little bit differently. They have removed their class size and teaching load um, waivers from the application. They didn't need them to go forward. And in their application, they have said if a teacher is teaching in person and virtually, or there's some sort of hybrid class, they'll be following the teaching load rules. Um, so they're not asking for a waiver of any of that. Do any of the board members have a specific question for Ms. Williams? I do. Thank you so much. I, um, I really appreciate y'all's um, coming to speak with us today. And I really like the idea of the conferences with parents. And I hope every district picks up on that and picks up on your liaison and how that is really um, looking to take care of all the needs of students. So thank y'all for doing that. Um, could you speak a little bit, I didn't get your application about um, the actual curriculum and which obviously we don't have decision over that but i would like to know a better idea of both elementary and high school and what that looks like because i understand the liaison is your main point of contact and they're not teaching the content so what does that content look like uh, well and that too is going on that individual kind of whole child approach and so with k2 we have curriculums off the state list benchmark workshop and wonders and um, they were using sunday system and anyway so we've got all those things going on, Hegarty's, all that kind of thing going on. And so for those students, they will either come on site and have that in the classroom, or they will be doing that synchronously or um, with the teacher in the classroom, or in our case, our head honcho here next door to me is a K-6 teacher and she's proficient in all those things. So she may even be doing those direct lessons with those students. If it doesn't, their schedule does not match up with the classroom, if that makes sense. Um, so that's what's going on there. And then we're using Lincoln Learning for everything that aligns 
We're also, again, using Virtual Arkansas for any of the things that they need to have offered. A lot of our students this year who've been most successful, and even those parents who have had the most COVID resistance about coming to school, they still wanted their students to come to things like ROTC or band or something like that. And they brought the students to school and we're, that's been the most successful piece is they have been coming for anything we could not offer online in a quality way or that gave the full experience. Uh, career technical ed classroom classes are the same way. Most of those students have come on site to do those. And it's really helped that this year we took a different approach too with the point of contacts. We had a district point of contact, but I made, uh, had an assistant principal become the point, point of contact for each building. And so they were making sure all the COVID regs were in place and everybody had cleaner in their classrooms and masks and social distancing. And so those principals or assistant principals who are our POCs on each campus are in those committee meetings. And that has really helped those families to know that there's somebody watching out for that and making those allowances. And so again, the curriculum, Lincoln Learning, I'm gonna say is the heart of it, but at the same time, it's really probably 50% at the end of the day because of each child and their needs. I hope that answers your question. That does, that helps. As far as the role of teachers in that K-6, will they be doing the dual role of both in-person and online? No. If, unless there's an a, unless there's a synchronous learning piece, and those are really far, I mean, very few in number. Most of those students were pushing them to the classroom if at all possible because that's the full experience. But I will say we've got a couple of mental health situations that the therapists are asking for them not to be in that classroom, and maybe not the whole year, but at least parts of the year because they've seen that virtual learning has really helped with some of that. And so I'm not gonna say 100%, but I'm gonna say just recently we had one and this and Ms. Hall was talking to that teacher about next year. And like, do you think this is doable for us to have this synchronous learning in this one course? And so they were working through that to see what they could do for that student in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Williams, I just wanted to say that I, I also was very impressed with the committee um, having that as far as getting students in and then also the li 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 liaison uh, those were two uh, parts of your piece that really stood out to me as being great and and I just want to make sure I understand because uh, this was my only question about your program was the K2 as far as reading is that part of it going to be synchronous Yes, ma'am, it will be synchronous either with the classroom or individually with Ms. Hall because she is a K-6 licensed teacher, a lot of years of experience and training. And she, if it, so I'm going to say, if we can get them with the classroom teacher during reading time, yes. If they can come to school, that's what we're really preferring. And if that doesn't work out with schedule, then Ms. Hall will do that on her, her time. So it might be at one o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to say, instead of maybe eight o'clock when the other students are doing that. And so it would be one-on-one -on -one in that case. Uh, with our dyslexia, that's how we've handled that as well. If they will come up for that small group instruction, that's what we prefer. Um, if they won't, if they can do it synchronously with their small group, if they're in a small group, then we do that. If not, then we schedule time one-on-one -on -one with the dyslexia interventionist. And how many days a week will that K-2 piece be? That will be five days a week. Okay, all right, thank you. I have a uh, question. Are you screening your students before they go into your virtual program? Yes, ma'am. We are screening, but at the same time, I'm not going to say it's just a black and white, cut and dry situation. Uh, we are looking at all their star scores, their ACT Aspire scores this year, in which is we have that privilege to say, how much were you online? How much did you engage? How much involvement did you have? Did you come up for, uh, because we've had some virtual days where they come up and meet and, you know, with parents and things like that, did you attend those things? Were parents um, answering or responding to phone calls? So all of that is coming out in those committee meetings. And it's not a gotcha, it's a conversation. And that has made it very clear for parents. And so when they say, oh, I really wanna do this. Okay, well, let's look back at this year. You weren't logging in or, you know, those types of things. And so that's made it where, oh, I see they're not gonna let me do that this year. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to hold me accountable. And so that has really just weeded itself out. But yes, when we come to the meetings, it's data driven and that's in our screening, I guess you could call it. We're pulling all of that in advance to see if you're a good fit for this or not. 
And then how are you working with your parents to get them on board as far as being a, a coach at home? Uh, that has come through the liaisons, and I'm going to say that was the piece when we were doing this before COVID, that one year in our trial year, I guess I will say, that we saw made, it was the game changer. It was 100% the game changer. And that was us all sitting in a room trying to figure out what we were going to do to deal with expulsion cases. And a few, like I said, of these medically fragile students that I'm gonna say is going through chemo repeatedly. We had just a handful of those situations. And we knew classroom teachers, they've got their hands full all day anyways. They do not have time to, you know, at two o'clock when mom's home, make that phone call, they might be in the middle of math or whatever. And so pulling that teacher out that was licensed, who had experience, had some a lot of them are people been in our district a while they know families already so we're not just putting anybody in that position but we saw that that liaison was the game changer they were the ones who could email find that best form of communication the parent would respond to whether it's through our remind or you know like i said email phone call text whatever it was we do have one phone a school cell phone that we purchased this year we're not big school cell phone people here uh, but we did and that number now is the virtual phone number so parents some parents love to text and they will text you all day long but before they would not answer a phone call and so it's really just it goes back to individual child and family and that liaison being freed up all day long to do that work and and our coordinator here so um and miss hall like i said she has just carried our torch this year and done a phenomenal job through the waves of this but the what we talked about this at length what we have learned about families and the families we have connected with this year is the biggest win in my opinion because it shows that when you really invest in people and you're very, you know, you're there for them, pretty much kind of day or night is the way it feels sometimes. But when you're there for them, that's when you start making differences for kids. And so it's kids that we just, in the past, we didn't know all this before. And through this process, that's what we've learned. Um, and those relationships, as you know, that's how you get kids back on side if that's where they need to be. It all goes back to relationships with people. Thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Williams, I have one more question that I forgot. In there, you, you had recommended 60 for your liaison, and you were basing that on past experience. Can you tell me a little bit how you came up with that number of 60, and if you tried to go over that, what were some experiences that had happened with that? Yes, ma'am, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say at the beginning of COVID, I was like, okay, we need five liaisons. No, I need six liaisons. You know, it was just like, this many kids aren't coming to school. You're going to become a liaison. But I wasn't pulling anybody. I wanted experienced teachers. But it was really just because we stayed in constant communication. Like, what can you handle? What were you able to accomplish today effectively? That kind of thing. And it quickly turned out to 60 was that max. Um, right now, we won't even have that next year. We're looking at, like I said, 25. But I will not put more than 60 students under the watch of a liaison because we found it was almost at 61. They couldn't get to them all, if that makes any sense. Okay. And so that was just max capacity about what they could do in their typical work day and meet with all the families, have the meetings, check on all the work, make sure the grades were in, you know, all those things. We just found that out by conversation and I guess informal data collection. I mean, we weren't, we didn't have a spreadsheet on that. We got one on everything else, but uh, that was really how that worked out. That we saw at 60, that was the max capacity that they could take care of in a week. That was very helpful, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, if there's no other questions for Ms. Williams, then we'll move to another district, is that okay? Okay, so let's go back to the first district that we had, um, Westside and Johnson County and Guy Fenter Co-op. I know they both are on. Um, and so, Dr. Pride, if you want to introduce the, tell us a little bit about the district. I sure will. Good morning. Tiffany Pride, Assistant Commissioner of Learning Services. All right, so I'm here to give an overview of the application for Westside Johnson School District. Um, and they are, as um, Stacy just mentioned, a part of the Guy Fenter uh, consortium and their grade levels are K-12. They, in terms of interaction, it's going to be both asynchronous and synchronous. K-6 students have one Zoom per content per week required with an opportunity of at least three sessions uh, per week. And then grades 7 through 12, uh, one Zoom per week is required. Um, in terms of instructional providers and thinking about platforms, we have for K-6, the Red Comet Buzz LMS. 
712 Virtual Arkansas will be um, their partner with that. In terms of teacher roles, of course, you know, this is 100% virtual. Um, K-6 um, teachers will not have a dual role. They will just be strictly virtual or on site. And those roles are defined in relationship with the consortium. Uh, they also have some provisions where their uh, 712 teachers will have parapros to support um, teachers in terms of um, making contact and supporting them with uh, some of those pieces that they have for monitoring. District supports, they do have a district point of uh, contact between, to communicate between Guy Fincher and the school district. And of course they can speak more about that uh, if you have questions. Um, then teacher supports, there are numerous teacher supports from training to ongoing PD opportunities um, and uh, support from content experts and um, tech support. They have that those provisions there. Also, they're going to monitor students in terms of surveys for parents, students, and also they're gonna be monitoring um, points in data to ensure students are progressing from using ACT Aspire summative pieces to see where they're gonna start. They're gonna be looking at their grade progressions with grades and also district assessments. So they have formative sets, assessments there as checkpoints. And um, also um, in terms of waivers, we see they have three attendance, the six hour day and clock hours. And I do wanna note that this is one example where we um, still had some areas where we wanted to be sure to monitor and we noted those with that district in terms of ensuring that K-2 students, um, that there is a close eye on those students learning to read because of the science of reading, and we know that those that K-2 band is essential in terms of making sure that students master concepts for reading. So that's um, Westside Johnson, and we have Superintendent Bradley Kent on, as well as Mr. Roy Hester from Guy Fincher. You had a question, Kara? Um, so as Dr. Pride just said, they are not requesting class size and teaching load waivers because all of their courses are gonna be 100% virtual. Um, and one thing um, that I forgot to mention earlier is that in the law, it says that teaching load does not apply to 100% virtual schools or programs. So um, earlier I said it was just in rule, but just so you know, that one piece is in law. We can talk a little bit more about that later. So the attendance waiver that they have requested is pretty much for the same reason as Truman. They have asynchronous components um, and use LMS logins and engagement um, to, to do attendance rather than having a teacher note attendance every single day. So that's why they have requested that waiver. Again, because they have asynchronous components and their synchronous components are not all day, every day, they have the waiver for the six hour instructional day and a waiver of high school units of credit um, for 120 clock hours. So they can give high school units of credit even if the course doesn't meet synchronously for 120 clock hours. Um, those are the only three that they have requested. Um, and so if there aren't any questions, I'll turn it over to the folks on the Zoom. Thank you. Mr. Kent, do you wanna just kind of give an overview of the process at your district? I believe you're on mute. Yes. Now, um, sure I can. So uh, in, in the process that we started, it, we went, uh, and, and to be honest, uh, I have quite a bit of new support in doing this, but I took the lead on, on writing this plan and, and uh, started with the template, started with the waivers that I felt we were going to need. Um, Mr. Hester and Ms. Miller from the co-op were, were very much involved in in this and in helping us and a, a lot of feedback from the department on it um i revised this this multiple times uh just based on feedback from them uh we uh were a, maybe a little bit different than what some other districts are doing as far as their virtual planning that we are we have chosen to um, partner with the co-op in a consortium uh with other districts in our co-op uh, to provide uh, virtual teachers for our kiddos. Um, you know, the main, one of the main reasons for us doing this is, as all of you probably, probably are, are well aware is, um, 
virtual created some challenges for us this year, just simply in the fact that we have some some folks that are better at instructing that way than others. Uh, this was one major way we felt like our virtual students, uh, we, we felt like they were getting some equity in it. They'd have a, a solid, you know, the, the co-op's going to hire a solid virtual teacher, we think, that's um, well-versed in, in all of the things that they need to be to, to, uh, to conduct this. And so um, that was one of the major reasons for us is, is we felt like those that, and, and make no mistake, we're encouraging our kiddos to come back. Um, we have, we, I have had personal conversations with several, several parents, um, and we're encouraging them to come back, but we do know that, that some of them are, are going to choose virtual. So we felt like this was a way that, um, that, that we could provide, um, equity across the board. You know, we, instead of, uh, having a, a couple of teachers that, that may struggle, uh, in some areas where creating a virtual lesson takes them honestly four five six hours and others can can get it done quicker so and, and present material more efficiently that way so um quick overview of of our choices and uh and uh what we uh what we decided to uh to do for for next year I'll just share a little bit about the co-op and why we why we decided to do a consortium for our, for our schools. As Mr. Kent alluded to, uh, our schools struggled a lot last year. And I know you all heard a lot of teachers struggled because a lot of the teachers were teaching both uh, virtually and face-to-face. -face. And that put a lot of extra work on those uh, teachers. And we felt like we needed to do something to help alleviate some of that, that work on those teachers. Uh, a lot of our schools were small. Mr. Hester, you went mute for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, and I don't know where I went mute at, but I'm just trying to explain a little bit about why we went with a consortium for our schools. A lot of our schools are small. They can't dedicate a classroom teacher to teach students virtually. Uh, the ones that did both last year, I mean, just about burnt them out doing, trying to teach both uh, virtual students and uh, those face-to-face -face students. So we're trying to alleviate some of that and help our schools out, especially our smaller schools. Uh, we feel like in, in providing a consortium, uh, they can get a better bang for their buck rather than them trying to, to go out and just hire one teacher to, to work with their students. Uh, we are using the Red Comet uh, curriculum uh, platform. It's the Buzz platform, and we chose them because that's what Lincoln Learning is. A lot of our kids used that this year. We didn't want them to have to change to a different type of platform. We wanted something that was familiar with them, familiar with their parents. Red Comet is an approved uh, virtual provider through the state. They're on the state approved list. We wanted to go with someone who, whose curriculum was tied to our frameworks. So, uh, that's kind of a nutshell why we did that. A lot of our schools are concerned about these children that if they don't have a virtual option, then they will go the homeschool route. And if they go the homeschool route, uh, a lot of the parents are not equipped uh, to work with those students without some type of curriculum. And we're, we're afraid that if they do that, there, there's no accountability uh, virtually for those homeschool students. And this does allow some virtual, I mean, some contact and some accountability with the school district. Now my TCC coordinator, Angela Miller is here and she can explain a lot more about the day-to-day -day, uh, look of how this consortium will work and what the students will be seeing and what the parents will be seeing and how we will correspond back and forth with them. So if you have any questions on those details, she's here to answer those kind of questions. Um, I know that there um, probably has been some question about how are we going to ensure instruction for K-6 students with requiring one Zoom session per week. Um, they have the opportunity to attend three Zoom sessions per content area per week, but we are requiring um, at least one 
That, however, does not mean that is all of the contact that the teachers and students will have. We also plan to have small group instruction. They will meet in teams for group work or project work. Um, we have each teacher will have a paraprofessional that will also be able to go in and work with students and provide extra help or tutoring should it be necessary. Uh, the requirement for our teachers is that they make communication with the student every day, whether it is whether they're learning synchronous or asynchronous. So either the para and or the teacher will make contact daily, uh, or I mean a minimum of one of them. And also our virtual coordinator will also make contact once a week with the parents and the child and to discuss progress, weekly reports, and those that same information will go to the school district point of connection as well. Um, I believe the other question that Dr. Pride mentioned uh, concerning K-2 and the science of reading, um, we know that is a very large concern um, because you know we have a huge state initiative with it as well and doing that virtually is not going to be easy. Um, we have addressed what programs that we will use for each of the uh, components required for science of reading. We plan to use the integrity program to look at phonological awareness. And we're also going to use the foundations program to address uh, other components. Our literacy specialists at the co-op are going to be um, on hand. I have four of them to work with the teachers at all times um, to make sure that the science of reading is being implemented through instruction. Um, and actually our teachers and coordinator that have been hired to oversee the virtual instruction are already enrolled in the foundation's training this summer, and they've all been RISE trained as well. So um, we're thinking that um, with support from the specialists who train anyway, that we should be able to work really well with the K-2 students on the science of reading components. And um, it may, require lots of meeting individually with students, but we're prepared to do that to make sure that they get what they need. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Kent or the co-op, Ms. Miller? Yes, I do, thank you all. Um, how, just sort of wrapping my mind around what this model looks like. Were, will teachers be employed by the co-op? And how will things such as um, special ed meetings, dyslexia, uh, screenings, those type of things occur? Um, yes, the um, teachers are employed by the co-op and the coordinator as well. Um, and for things like special education, um, dyslexia intervention, that will come from the school district. We will work closely with the special education teachers that the students are familiar with on site, as well as the dyslexia interventionists to schedule them a time to either meet with their small group uh, or when their on-site small group meets, they would meet with them as well, or it may be individual if that's what's needed. Uh, but there will be lots of communication with the point of connection and the district administrators to make sure that the services are still met for each student. Okay, thank you. I think you preemptively answered a lot of my questions, but I want to touch base. Uh, class size for the K-3? I know they'll have a para. Does that mean they'll be larger? Uh, not necessarily. Um, at this point, we have had the districts that are participating through the co-op consortium to give us kind of a ballpark number of, of spots that their district would like. Um, and so, you know, the spots we have for K-3, I believe we have 115 spots reserved, but we don't really anticipate having 115 students in those spots. Okay. So at most it would be 115 for a teacher and a para okay. in that grade band. That makes sense. As far as families who might start virtual and end up wanting to make the decision to go back local, how will that work between between you all? Um, well, it will require lots of communication between the school district and the co-op. Um, at any point, uh, Red Comet has told us that, you know, they can put in the pacing guides that our current on-site school districts use. So we're hoping that the pacing will largely be the same and we should be able to put them in 
to the classroom back on site where they've left off. If it does mean that they have to have um, some extra intervention to catch them up to the on-site students, then we're prepared to offer that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. y'all. I have a, a question as well. I know you've talked about the paraprofessionals. Um, I think it's Westside that is also talking about their facilitators. Can you talk to us about the facilitator's role? And maybe this goes back to Mr. Kent. I'm not really clear on who's in charge of the parapros and the facilitators and how that works. Are you speaking towards the facilitators for the 712 or yes. for the K6? 712. Um, Mr. Kent, that's the virtual Arkansas piece. You're muted. I, I can speak to that for the 712. They're using virtual Arkansas. John Ashworth, I'm the executive director of virtual Arkansas. Uh, so every school that utilizes virtual Arkansas is required to have uh, a local facilitator. That's uh, a very important piece. It's a necessary piece. So not only do we have the eyes of the teacher on the student, we have the eyes of the facilitator on the teacher. They're, they're the um, the local eyes and ears, uh, that is our point of contact. So every school district is required to have a local facilitator. Okay, thank you. How many uh, schools are in this consortium? You've got a fairly large uh, co-op area. Uh, currently we have 12 districts that are participating in this virtual consortium. Okay. So which districts would not be then? Um, Cause I think you've got. Our larger districts are not, they're doing their own virtual. Um, and most of the ones that are participating are smaller. I believe the largest district that I have that's participating is Clarksville. Okay. And you believe you've got enough staff ready to go to, to do this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Miller, I have several questions about um, how the co-op is planning on, on doing this. Uh, in the K, let's say K two three uh, lower primary, what are what are you um, thinking as far as number of teachers? Uh, well, we have one teacher and one paraprofessional for the K two grade band. So one teacher is going to do K two. And yes. she will have a she will have a pair from the co-op, not at the local district. That's correct. In addition to the special ed, dyslexia intervention, or other special services from the school district. Okay. So 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 she's going to do three Zooms a week with K one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And then uh, are, are those going to be um, teaching Zooms where she would maybe be teaching science of reading or are those going to be check-in Zooms? They will be instructional Zooms. Okay. And then what, what will the students be doing the rest of the time? Uh, they will be working through assignments uh, in small groups or individually uh, or project-based assignments that are through the Red Comet platform using the Arkansas standards. Okay, and so that that one teacher will be responsible for four um, content areas. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming four core content areas in K-3, is that right? K-2, yes. K-2 or K-3? K-2. K-2, okay. And she's gonna do that in, in three Zooms a week for three grades yes ma'am okay and then she's also going to be responsible for contacting students and parents and building those relationships our coordinator will take the large role on the um, working with the parents and making contact with students but yes the teachers will also make contact with the students through the zoom as well I mean 
they may be checking emails, uh, they may be doing individual sessions, and they may be doing the instruction. Okay, and then um, you, you mentioned some small group. What are, what are you thinking on that? Uh, I think that will be dependent on the progress monitoring. If we see that there are certain skills that students are struggling with in a content area, we will schedule small group time for them to get one-on-one -on -one help or in small group setting. Um, and if there should be, you know, some kind of STEM work or project work, they may also have small group time uh, to work on things like that. Okay. So you were looking at around 115 students, you said K K2, is that what you said? Yes. All right, and then what about 3-6? Um, I believe 3-6 was right around 100 students. And how many teachers are you looking at there? We have one teacher for 3-6 for and a paraprofessional. Is that a full-time para? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I, you know, I, just hearing from, from the... Um, the district before and and they were having their their uh, teachers do a lot of synchronous during the week but then in addition to that they were going to have a liaison with a maximum of 60 and they were kind of going on past experience so, you know I, I'm a little concerned about the the load that this teacher is going to have you know teaching content for three different grades in all subject areas and also trying to build relationships with parents and students and keeping track of where they're at you know um, I'm just uh, telling you that I, I have some concerns there especially in K2 where we're thinking that these first years these formative years are so vital for students to be able to develop those foundations for good reading that's going to follow them not just through high school but through life all, all the way through and so so that is a little bit concerning to me about this this co-op plan um, well, I mean, yes, I can see that it, it is a larger load to ask a teacher to do, but that is where, you know, where they were calling their person a liaison. Ours is called the coordinator um, in a lot, and she will have a lot of the same role, but our content specialists in science, math, and literacy and gifted and talented, they're all prepared to step in and help with the role should it be needed. Um, so we do have plans, you know, if we see that, you know, it's not working to progress monitor as well as we think we should, or um, we're having trouble keeping up with just the number versus the teacher. I mean, we're going to do what's right for kids and we would either take on additional staff or we would utilize our content specialists more. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about your dys dyslexia screening? And uh, who yes. The, uh, the school districts will do the dyslexia screening. Um, however, if there is someone, a student that's referred that's not on the normal, uh, I believe it's the second grade screener, then we would make arrangements for the student to either be screened on site by the dyslexia intervention in the district, interventionists in the district, or else uh, we also have a co-op uh, interventionist that could screen if necessary. So we're gonna make arrangements, whether it's going to their house to do it, if it needs to be done, or bringing them on site to have the screening done, then we will make arrangements with the district for that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or anything that we need before we move on to the next district? Thank you guys for being on. Um, the next, the third district that we're going to talk about today is Texarkana. Dawn, you want to come on up, and Mary Claire. Um, Texarkana has per partnered with Virtual Arkansas. Um, and I'm going to let Dawn and Mary Claire go over their waivers and just a quick overview. Good morning, <clears throat> Dawn Benton, Research and Technology. So I, do, I believe Becky Kessler is online or a representative from Texarkana Schools is online yes. and hopefully she'll chime in in just a moment. Just a brief overview and I'll let the experts speak about this. 
Um, and also, I want to point out that we are fortunate to have Kathy Swan and John Ashworth and Kirsten Wilson online as well. John, as he said earlier, is the, the executive director for Virtual Arkansas. Kathy is like the founder and one of those people who started the whole virtual movement in Arkansas, the digital learning movement in Arkansas. So it's great to have her on here with her expertise. And Kirsten, who also works for Virtual Arkansas until the end of this month, will be transitioning to a position on June 1 to become the state digital learning coordinator for Team Digital. So we have some really good experts in the room here listening. Um, we also have some folks that have a lot of background and historical knowledge about what we've been doing with virtual learning in Arkansas. I think it's important that I point out uh, with Team Digital and Virtual Arkansas, specifically Virtual Arkansas, they are nationally recognized and of course they're a leader in our state for virtual learning and all the resources that come with that. <clears throat> but other states are coming to them and asking them, how are you doing this and how are you being successful? I want to point that out. So if you guys have questions for John, Kathy, and or Kirsten at the end of the session, they're gonna hang around uh, until the end so you can ask them more specific questions about digital learning and the things that they're doing. So you've had a really good sampling so far of what we're looking at with uh, schools and their digital learning programs and you guys are asking some great, great questions and things that are making me think a little bit more, you know, making sure we covered that, did we cover that? And as I was looking through the applications and you've looked at some of these, they're like 30 pages long. There's a lot of meat and potatoes in there, but we know you can't cover every single thing that you're concerned about. So the, the questions are helping us think back too. Now, what are some things we wanna make sure we check as we're going along the way when we're doing our monitoring throughout the year to help schools, not to, as someone said earlier, not as a gotcha, but to help them make sure they have the resources <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and to make this successful. So, so Texarkana is creating or has created a digital learning academy. Uh, they're working on a K-12 component with a K-2 component that consists of four synchronous hours required daily. Now that's a, that's a different type of model and what we're gonna see as we look at a lot of these different digital learning programs is there are gonna be a lot of different models. And I like the analogy that was given earlier uh, that we're, we're individualizing uh, learning plans for kids, kind of like you would with a special needs student. And we've always talked about personalized learning and all those different concepts. Well, with digital learning, that's no different. We're making sure that we're, we're building um, a, a, an, an educational pathway for kids for, for them individually. Virtual learning, digital learning as we call it, is just another pathway for a lot of these kids. I think one of the concerns too is that we, we, we still keep falling back on what happened last year during our learning year. Um, and, and let's try to remember that as we're moving forward, there are a lot of lessons learned and, and I think our schools and our experts out there are doing a terrific job of covering some of those concerns for you guys. Uh, Texture Can is also looking at synchronous and asynchronous methods. As you get older and as kids can be a little bit more independent learners, there's also that opportunity for them to learn more synchronously or asynchronously. And I can tell you from per firsthand experience, I transitioned an entire higher ed leadership program from a face-to-face -to, -face to an asynchronous, synchronous learning pathway. It was hard. It was really, really hard and it took time. So our schools have had this whole year and then they've been working on it. They're gonna work on it all summer to ramp up as we move forward. So they're, they're putting in the work. They're answering all of our questions. And um, Texture Canada is definitely not short on that. They've answered a lot of questions. They're gonna have a de dedicated digital learning uh, academy principal and they're gonna have other dedicated uh, people with that as well. One of the things I liked about their plan as I was looking through it and I've, I've got notes on all these pages in here is that they're really being um, strategic when they look at the K-8 program and making sure that they have that synchronous, that in-touch piece and, and I think that's important for you guys to take note of. And if uh, Becky's on or, or representative from Texture Canna or let Mary Claire speak first about the waivers they're asking for because they are asking for all waivers. I'll let Mary talk about that and then we'll let the experts speak about what they're doing in their district. Thank you. So I think this one will give you a good example of when the class size waiver is actually necessary. So quickly on the attendance piece, it's the exact same as the other ones because they've got asynchronous components and they're using a learning management system. Um, they need that waiver. So when it comes to class size, if you'll look at chart three, I hope that this chart can, can help kind of guide this because even for me, class size and teaching load and large group instruction and virtual exceptions really can get muddy. So on chart three, if you'll look and see in K-4, 
large group instruction does not apply to class size. So although virtual courses count as large group instruction, large group instruction does not apply to K-4. So since in the, in the Texarkana application they're doing big synchronous pieces in their elementary grades, um, you'll look, if you look on their application on page four, they've laid out their class size. So in kindergarten, they're going to be meeting class size, but it is in that one through four, their maximum class size will be 30. The, the maximum class size for one through three is 25 with an uh, average of 23 and for fourth grade is 28 with an average of 25. So they'll be going over by a couple of students in their synchronous pieces, which is why they need the class size and teaching load waiver. I mean the class size waiver. They don't need the teaching load waiver because teaching load does not apply to virtual, 100% virtual programs in schools. So they will need the class size waiver and that's why because they have those synchronous pieces in their elementary um, school. So I hope that kind of helps explain kind of the difference there. The six hour instructional day and the clock hours are the exact same as we've talked about with the other schools because of the asynchronous components and same with recess. And in their application, they did say students are gonna be assigned physical activities, um, but they're just not gonna be supervised in the same way that they would be um, in in-person learning. So that's the reason for that waiver there. Um, so if there aren't any questions, I'll let you ask questions to the applicant. Can if you'd like to go ahead and just give us a little quick overview of your program and then they can ask you questions. Okay, uh, I am Becky Kessler, I'm the superintendent, and today I have with me Robin Hickerson, our assistant superintendent. Uh, Leah Sams is going to be our principal for the Digital Learning Academy, and online we have Rachel Scott, is our magnet director, and we also have Monica Morris from the co op. She actually helped us uh, develop our plan. And uh, like he said, we're a little different because we, we have a designated principal for our uh, Digital Learning Academy. And just like everybody else in the state, we really struggled this year with virtual learning. So when we went to, de to develop the plan, we looked at all the, the struggles and the successes. And I think we really put together a great plan based on those. So Leah and Rachel and Robin and Monica together have really looked at everything from the, the teachers to make sure we have the best teachers in place. They surveyed parents. And I'm really gonna just turn it over to Leah and let you let her tell you how they were able to create the plan. So Leah. Okay, so towards the beginning, we reached out to teachers. Um, as a virtual teacher this year, what what is working? What it, you know, what are your struggles? Um, taking all of that into account, we reached out to virtual parents. Um, as a parent, how are you seeing your child successful? What are the struggles for you as a parent? And oftentimes we're talking about the students with virtual learning, it's, it's a family. It is a family affair. It is um, making sure that all members of the family are engaged because oftentimes it may not even be just the parents, it could be grandparents. Um, making sure that whoever is helping that student during the day, we have their support and that open communication. Um, we, we know that um, making sure that students are accountable, um, we, you've had some lack of engagement, um, but we've looked at what is working in our district. What was working was synchronous learning in pockets when certain schools made sure that they had a dedicated virtual teacher. That the great success. Um, we have two kindergarten classes. If you look at their data, it compares to any other kindergarten class and both of those teachers have synchronous learning. Um, we built the plan so that there are four days synchronous and one day is asynchronous because we think it's important to make sure that teachers have that time to work with one-on-one -on -one students if they're struggling. They can have small groups. Um, we have students and families that are local, invite them to campus and we have that day committed to making sure um, that, that you know, RTI piece is met um, one, we have that built into the daily schedules, but two, we have a day completely dedicated to that. Um, one thing that is kind of neat is we have a Wi-Fi bus um, that has, um, we can take it around town. Um, it has Wi-Fi, you can get on. A, we have printers, computers that we can have on that bus. So if families um, 
if there's a reason that they cannot come to us, we can get the bus and take to them, um, which is just a neat piece that um, we want to make sure that, you know, no kid is left behind, um, that we're doing whatever we can do to make sure that, that they have all the resources that they need. Um, the intake meeting is going to be huge for families. You know, a lot of times you learn from um, past mistakes and what not to do versus what to do. And so making sure that some of the struggles were easy fixes um, if students just knew how to log onto a computer or the families knew how to log onto a computer. And that seems so basic, but making sure that we are starting at the basics with families. Um, that intake meeting, making sure that they know how to log on, all the passwords, how to reach us, resources, and getting them familiar with where all our virtual teachers will be housed. So um, all virtual teachers for the Texarkana Arkansas School District will be housed together um, with an elementary school, North Heights Community School. And so our teachers, even though they will be all teaching only virtual students, they have that sense of community um, so that they can be a part of some team meetings within, a, within the PLCs. Um, and then but we want parents familiar and comfortable with our location. We feel like if they understand how to reach everyone that they are gonna be more willing to reach out. And so having that intake meeting, um, two, some of the food security pieces were mentioned. Um, right now we are in a partnership where all, you know, all of our students are eating free. Um, so we wanna make sure that that food security continues for those virtual students. And so we have um, a weekly pickup where families can come and pick up meals um, for the week, which is huge um, it's just an added benefit and all of those resources available that we have we want to make sure that that families know that up front um, and so that intake meeting is going to be um, a huge piece of the success for the students and their families um, for our teachers you know some students have just come you know found their niche in virtual learning and the same goes for teachers and so several a um, couple months ago we reached out um, two teachers on who would want to teach virtual. And so um, throughout our district, we had 26 teachers that applied to be in the virtual program. So all of the teachers um, believe in what we're doing. They understand the um, importance of being able to be just a dedicated virtual teacher. Um, and, and one thing, you know, it's the years looking at um, how many years have we requested for um, for the program, that was a, a big piece for our community. Um, being able to say that we had, you know, requested five years, um, it gave some uh, peace of mind to families that we were not going to just put this out there and then take the rug out from under them and say, you know, we're not doing it anymore. Um, so knowing that we have some ownership of the program, the, the families feel like this is something that's gonna be able um, to be a resource for them for years to come, um, I think has kind of give some given some families a peace of mind of um, wanting to, to be a part of the program. Um, you know, and looking at students that have been successful this year in virtual learning, that is gonna be a key piece of making sure um, for those that have applied. You know, we wanna make sure, were they successful this year? Um, if we get to a point in in the year where um, we have a student that's struggling, we have different um, layers of support for the teachers and the students. Um, somebody talked about kind of started teaching every student like they had an IEP. Um, in our plan, we have an indiv individualized student intervention plan. So if we see a student is struggling, we bring those parents, families in, the teachers in, and we create a plan just for that kid. If we understand that the virtual is not, um, the students not being successful, we do not want to keep the student um, in a downward trend. And so that team would then determine, you know, placement, what's going to be the best for that student. And um, so all of those measures are in place for um, the students, but also for the teachers. So if you have questions, I'm sure I'm um, forgetting a few things, but um, we're excited because, you know, they are district teachers um, teaching our curriculum to our students, which we think is exciting because, you um, we're being able to reach the students with just like they were in the classroom, creating that same sense of community with the same content. Do you have 
Um, yeah, so for our teachers, we had 26 teachers um, have, that have applied to be a part of the program. Um, for students, we put out a, um, an application process in the end of May. Right now, we have 27 students that have reached out. And we, I, we do feel like that number will grow. Um, we have had homeschool, fam homeschool families reach out um, wanting to be a part of the program, um, which they have been very excited because they have teachers that um, will be on campus. So even though they want to be homeschooled, um, they would still be able to be taught by teachers um, locally. And right now we're planning on having 13 certified teachers in the program. So if, if as it stands, if we only have 27 students, we certainly won't meet those class size waivers. <laughs> Correct, yeah. And, and a lot of that, that making sure it's capped because we want to make sure that teachers feel supported, that they can do the work. Um, you know, hopefully we get to a point where, you know, we're looking at, at students not that we need to turn them away, that we need to hire more teachers um, for the program. But we want to make that number where students and teachers can both be successful. Do any, does anyone have a question for Dr. Kelso or her group or her team? I do. I just want to uh, commend you on all of your, your work that you've done on this. I, I think what, I, what I'm seeing here is very impressive and the, the dedicated principal, the dedicated learning academy, digital learning academy. I also wanted to ask if you would just speak a little more to your live sessions. Uh, that was, I think, four, four times a week or on four different days a week. I know some of the challenges with that involve scheduling as well as bandwidth, the technology and the connectivity for students, equipment at home to be able to support those live sessions. How have you addressed some of that and have you seen uh, the payoff on that? I would think that you would. I, I know live sessions can have a tremendous impact on building community and relationships and engagement. So I just wanted to see if you'd speak a little more to that. Yes, yeah, so the, the model came from uh, one of our elementaries that is currently teaching four days a week synchronously. Um, and they start in the morning like a regular school day. They have a morning meeting. Um, they're self-contained teachers, so they are teaching all content areas. Um, they will have a reading for 45 minutes. They will have some independent work and the teachers, and they, they'll be using Zoom, um, could then bring small groups in and so some students can work individually, the teacher can work with some of those small groups, and they have a break, they go to math. Um, and so their day, same sort of thing, they have 45 minutes, 40, you know, some of the minutes, um, or, you know, we're still trying to make sure that, that we have the best schedule in place. Um, and, and we know through the solution tree process and PLC process that master schedule is huge. Um, and so making sure that we, we have that master schedule perfectly, but, so, so minutes, you know, I'm, I'm speaking vaguely. Um, so there would be a break and the same thing goes for all the subjects and that's how the day would work. So it would be like a student in a classroom with their teacher. Um, that would be four days a week and we, they would be using Zoom. And the technology, the students will have the computers that actually have the internet already built into them. And every student will have exactly the same type of uh, device so the internet will be furnished for them. Yes. Yeah, so the, the Chromebooks have the built-in. Yeah, Kajit have the built-in internet. Um, so and all students would have the same device, which we you know feel like will um, help with troubleshooting problems. Um, and so if a student calls, um, you know, and asks if they're having a problem with a Chromebook, everybody has the same Chromebook, so it's easy to kind of troubleshoot what the what the problem is. But so, and all of the Chromebooks will have the built-in um, internet, so they they had that provided for them. They've already been purchased. Yes, so yeah. we already have those. And I'm, the teacher that she's referencing, is she's incredible to watch. And she's one of the teachers that will be teaching in the Digital Learning Academy. And when we went into this, we said, we want to, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it right. We wanna have a model program that we could like, you know, anyone would wanna come and watch what, what we're doing. It's like those kids are there. It's just like, they're, they're, if she's singing a song, it's kindergarten. All the kids are singing on the screen and they're all interacting. It's just like they're in a classroom, but they're at home. And you know, if they're not participating, she's, it's just like they're in the classroom. It's, it's incredible to watch this teacher. And 
everybody in this program, like Leah said, she interviewed the teachers, they had to apply. If they're not passionate about digital learning, they're not gonna be part of the digital academy. So I think that we, we really hit on something that's that's gonna be you know, absolutely amazing. Yeah, making sure that students feel that sense of community. Um, I think everybody wants to be a, a part of a team um, or a, a part of something. And so making sure that, um, you know, those kids, they start to know each other. Um, and it, you know, it's talking with teachers how, you know, at the beginning of the year, at the first of the Zoom, um, you know, nobody said a word. Um, and we're now, you know, these students who have met virtually every day, four days a week for the school year, um, they know each other, they are friends. And so making sure that they are a part of that community. Um, you know, the students will still continue to be assigned to their home campus. And so if, um, you know, their school's having a dress up day, we wanna make sure that they feel like they can dress up. Um, and then us, all the virtual teachers being housed on an elementary campus, um, that's another kind of piece of that community. Um, you know, we want them to be able to feel comfortable to come on campus. Um, when you get into, you know, the junior high, those students can still be a part of athletics can be part of um, the music programs. And so making sure that um, they know that they are Texarkana Arkansas School District students, I think is very important um, to all of us. Hey, Dr. Kessler, this is Johnny. I've got a question. I think you mentioned something about uh, the homeschool students or homeschool families reaching out to you. Are yes. those, were those uh, within your district or were you having any contact yeah. you from outside your district? We actually had two that, uh, for the first time ever, we had two school choice applications come in uh, that were coming from outside the district. Okay, but the, the homeschool families, those were from, from inside your district? Yeah, uh, the homeschool, yeah, what you're talking about? They're, they're from out. From outside the district. Okay, thank you. It, lo local, um, but attending other districts. They, 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 they had other been districts. attending other yeah. districts. Okay. The home. Mm -hmm. Their homeschool would, I mean, their, their school that they would have attended was outside the district, correct? But they were homeschooling. Does that make any sense? Great. Thank you for the clarification. Dr. Kessler, I just wanted to compliment you on, on this program. To me, this was one of the most impressive ones and well thought out that we saw. I, I uh, like the, the uh, making sure that, and, and you said it very well, making sure numbers where both students and teachers could be successful. And so this was very impressive. Uh, I, I really like it. The only thing that, that you said this morning that concerned me at all was you said that you had 27 students apply so far and 13 teachers planned. Uh, financially, how are you going to be able to keep going if those numbers continue? Well, we are actually in the process of changing over several schools. We just built a new school. And so we know those numbers are probably gonna continue to go up because we are consolidating some schools. Um, and so we, we expect those numbers to, to continue to, to rise, but we, we are actually overstaffed at this point. And so uh, we are gonna have some additional teachers so we're just going to have to, you know, through attrition, we're going to have to absorb some of those uh, teachers. But, um, you know, we're just going to have to work through it right now. Okay. So. But, yes, and um, I, I work in HR, so I can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, our population is very fluid right now because we do have students applying to attend our new elementary schools. Um, and as our student population shifts, our staff will shift along with them. So we have what we call holes, you know, in some of our buildings. And if those students don't gravitate toward this digital learning academy, they may be assigned, for example, to a second grade spot in our um, community school or a third grade spot in our Harmony school. Um, right now, we are just in a a time in which our students are, are moving around and our staff, the adults, will shift according to our student numbers as we move into the fall. Well, and also, I mean, we haven't aggressively recruited. I mean, we, we put the, the application transfer in um, because, again, we had several, a couple 
to new schools. Um, but, you know, waiting on approval. I think that, you know, once I mean, it is approved before the board that um, the promotion and the recruitment will um, definitely um, get stronger. Okay. All right. Well, I just want you to know how impressed that I was with your application, and uh, I'm anxious to see results in the future. Well, they worked, they worked very hard on it. I cannot take any credit for it. I have a great team, and they worked very hard on it. Thank you all again. I too am impressed by what I see as a very high contact program. Speak a little bit about high school. It, are, will students be entirely virtual Arkansas and the 912? Will they have options to do any courses on campus or entirely virtual? What will that look like? So they would be entirely virtual. Like um, some of the other grades though, they would still be able to come on uh, campus for music programs, band, um, or athletics, but so that would be an all virtual program for 912. And will they have a local point of contact, local liaison? What will that look like? Yeah, so we have it right now, um, you know, say 100 kids um, go virtual for our Ohio being 912. And we are looking at one facilitator for every 50 students. Um, you know, ideally right now that is a, a paraprofessional. Um, we would love to see the program grow, that that is a, a certified teacher um, so that whenever we have testing on campus on site, because that is one of the requirements, um, that we have someone that um, can, can be a part of that, the bigger text, the testing picture. Um, but right now we have um, paraprofessionals assigned one um, for every 50 students and they would be making contact uh, pretty regularly. Okay, thank you. In that case, um, as far as, you know, w when a student is not doing well in virtual Arkansas, what does that relationship look like? Will virtual Arkansas will communicate with that facilitator on there, communicate with the school if there's an event where a student is really struggling and maybe needs to be in person or at least have that conversation? Well, that'd be cool. yeah, so, I mean, it would, it would be the same thing with that individualized team. Um, bringing the facilitator, the principal, I would be there. Um, the parents of the, the student that's in virtual Arkansas and making sure that we, that student has everything they need to be successful. Um, since we do have a location that they can come to um, and they, there would be supports there, um, making sure that they you know, have the tools, what it is, what's keeping them from being successful. Um, and then and putting those things in place for them. But so every student would have that that kind of individualized plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any other follow-up questions for that district? All right, so are we ready to go to the last district? Everybody okay? All right, so the last district is Rogers, and that's Carly to come up, and Mary Claire again to give an overview about Rogers. Good morning, Carly Saracini, Educator Effectiveness and Licensure, and today I'm going to do the brief overview of Rogers School District. And their grade level spanned for their virtual program is K-12, but they're ensuring in that K-2 a daily synchronous 45-minute reading lessons to provide that phonics and phonemic awareness so that they have their science of reading one-on-one. -on -one. So their instruction methods are asynchronous and synchronous. Their instructor providers for K-5 are teacher-created videos and curriculum with district curriculum, making sure that they provide all of those our state initiatives. And then six through 12, they're utilizing Florida virtual school curriculum, but yet it's being facilitated by Rogers teachers, teachers within the district. And those teacher roles, so that I know we've had uh, concerns about teacher roles their core teachers will only be teaching virtual. So their core teachers will not be teaching 
face-to-face uh, -face and they will be teaching virtual only. But K-5 activity teachers will have a dual role, but they will, be, they will have additional pay for those dual roles. And then 612 teachers will, just their elective teachers will have a dual role. And they will also be compensated with additional pay. Because we all know when it gets into those electives, uh, they may not make a complete class virtually. So, and they will also be utilizing their PLCs uh, to continue look at those tier ones and tier twos, which I know that Roger Hill is on here and I'm sure they will explain that in detail. Uh, their student supports are, again, that daily synchronous 45 minute K2 for that reading, and then two to three times a week, 30 minute small groups for math, and then three through five, that 45 minute synchronous with teacher three to four times a week. And also, uh, they have a great, if you've looked at their uh, proposal, they have a great explanation of their engagement procedures to make sure that students are being uh, continually making sure they're not falling through the cracks. And on teacher supports, not only will they utilize the PLCs, but they can also utilize the local uh, Northwest Arkansas Co-op and uh, training and will hire supplemental teachers if needed and uh, make sure that they will staff a technology help desk and uh, but they're going to utilize those formative assessments already and also look at those parent surveys. Class size K-3 will be 15 additional students. Four through five will be 20 additional students. And again, the teaching load at 6-8 uh, falls, is going to be 200 student limit, 9-12-300. But again, what is currently uh, their expectations and what has been uh, how many have already applied. So those are just those numbers. And they want to make sure uh, students receive instruction. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Claire about the waiver. So again, on the attendance waiver, exact same reasoning as the other schools. On class size, this is an example, just like the school we looked at before we're in their K-4 synchronous pieces. Some of them are gonna be small groups, so a waiver is not necessary, but um, in some of their K-4 synchronous pieces, they are gonna go over class size um, by 15 additional students in K-3 and 20 in, um, in fourth grade. So they would need a class size waiver in order to do that for their, their larger synchronous pieces. This is also a good example of when a teaching load waiver would be necessary. So as they discussed, their core content teachers will be 100% virtual, so there's no need for a teaching load waiver there. But because their K-5 activity teachers and their 6-12 elective teachers will have dual roles, well, they, were, they will teach some in person and some virtually, that exception doesn't apply in that situation. So they would need a waiver for teaching load for those activity teachers and those elective teachers. They are receiving additional compensation via stipend. Um, and so the reason the waiver is necessary is because that stipend is not exactly in line with what's required for additional compensation in law. So while they are receiving additional compensation, it's just not an amendment to their contract on a per student basis in the exact way that's in the law. So that's the reason for the waiver. Um, it's just because they're doing their compensation a little bit differently um, than, than is in the law. The last two pieces, which are their six hour instructional day, clock hours and recess, those are the exact same reasons that we've discussed in the other applications because of um, 
how hard it is to track that 40 minutes of recess in a virtual setting and because of the asynchronous pieces for clock hours and instructional day. I see that Dr. Barry is on here and we'll let him take it away for any, an overview. Good morning and thank you, Dr. Smith, for the opportunity to answer some questions this morning. I am blessed to have a tremendous staff that designed and implemented and, and provided leadership for an elementary and a secondary virtual program this year that was very well received by our parents. So I'm gonna turn it right to them for some brief comments, uh, starting with Sharla Osborne. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. In the room with me today, I have our director of virtual learning, Darlis Masco, and our K-5 principal, uh, Christy Brown. And so I just would, I'll give a brief overview of our process and uh, our planned program. We began this process um, with two, an elementary committee and a secondary committee. We reviewed our successes and struggles of the previous year and invited parents input and, as well as teacher input. Um, and from that input and with the help of our committees, we have developed and revised a program to accommodate students in what we are truly ver uh, viewing as a potentially transitional year from, uh, from the pandemic. So we're hoping that our, or we're planning for our program to accommodate both those parents who choose virtual because of their concern over COVID, as well as parents who would choose virtual for the flexibility that the program can offer. So we also want to appeal to those parents who may have chosen homeschool as an alternative. Um, at elementary, we have planned for both synchronous and asynchronous learning. As you heard, we will be addressing the science of reading with uh, at K-2 with uh, focus on uh, phonemic awareness and phonological awareness uh, five times a week uh, with some synchronous learning there. We will be using the same curriculum that is used on site for our elementary students. We'll be using uh, benchmark phonics, wit and wisdom, um, and illustrative mathematics. We have um, Rogers Public School teachers who have gone through an application process to be virtual teachers. Some of those will have had a year of virtual experience behind them as well as connections to on site uh, teachers and professional learning communities to help support them. We have asked for a limited um, class size. We, we will be going somewhat over what you would see on an on-site with some of our class on-site classroom uh, class size limit with some of our virtual classes, um, but it is very, very limited in comparison to what we might have seen last year. At secondary, um, we will be using a third party provider for curriculum through the Florida Virtual Learning System we um, have increased our student and parent support um, by providing Rogers teachers who also went through an application process to be selected um, to facilitate and intervene um, and to increase engagement um, with students and with parents. Um, our, it is true that at secondary, our elective teachers will be serving in a dual role capacity, but they will be compensated for their efforts um, and for both elementary and secondary, we have dedicated special education staff as well as dedicated virtual ESOL staff. We've also added a K-12 social worker um, who will be helping to facilitate social and emotional and mental health um, initiatives and as well as serving those families and their needs. I do want to clarify um, at the K-5 level, our art, music, PE, uh, library teachers will not be teaching dually. Um, they will be instead creating digital lessons, uh, which will be pushed out by the classroom teacher. They will be compensated for this work, which will be taking place over the summer um, with, a, with a, an hourly a rate for their curriculum work. Um, I think that pretty well sums up the um, bigger picture of our program. We, um, I think here in Rogers, we're looking to set the bar for a virtual program. 
we feel like we're on a path to excellence with this and we welcome your feedback and uh, we're happy to entertain any questions you may have at this time. I'll start with some questions. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I was particularly um, impressed by your approach in K2 with your daily reading lessons and, and check-in being synchronous. I like that and I'm glad you all have the ability to have those teachers fully dedicated to online. Um, but I do wonder about why, what's your theory for why you can increase class size at those younger grade levels? I have our, I apologize for that. I have our, uh, our principal for K-5 in the room with me and I'll defer to her on that question. Um, what we, the model that we used this year, um, we, we did, you know, synchronous lessons with our K-2 and what our teachers learned is they may have to have multiple synchronous lessons each day. It would be a 45 minute lesson, but they may teach it twice during the day because we do understand with K-2, even if, you know, at 25 we had 35 kids, we would only see 15 within a Zoom session and teach that lesson twice within the day and then also record one of those sessions so that if a, if a parent missed it or the learning coach or partner uh, would, would be able to watch it at a later time. Uh, we, we have, that's a lesson that we did learn this year that even with synchronous sessions, it doesn't mean that you have one synchronous for all students. Uh, we make in some sessions we have learned that you could have 12 in a kindergartners and first graders in a session. In some sessions, depending on the child's needs, you may have five. So teachers may be teaching multiple synchronous sessions within the day. Okay. Do you all not have the capacity just to hire more people so that you can stay within the classroom? I'm sorry, could yeah. you repeat that question, please? Yes, I'm, I'm curious as to why not just hire an additional teacher and, and, and keep that at the normal class size instead of not quite doubling, but going over at, in those grade levels. question is why would we not hire an additional teacher versus and and I will say you know right now with our teachers in place um, with our size we're much much smaller than we are this year um, and not hitting quite the 20 over or the or the 15 over um, but we felt like those numbers are manageable just with the experience that we had this year uh, in fact you know before we did the application teachers handled a caseload at times at the very beginning of the year in August and September that were much larger than that. And we got feedback from the teachers that taught virtual, dedicated to virtual this year, and, and, and reflected on what is a manageable classroom size. And from the K-2 perspective and the, the four or five perspective, they felt like the, the 15 and 20 over was something that they could manage and have managed this year. Being able to form relationships with the families, give appropriate amount of feedback, and have the amount of live synchronous Zooms that were needed for students and families. Okay, thank you. I think, yeah, how did families feel? <laughs> I guess I, I want to be convinced that this that we need to do that versus why don't I ask you to hire two kindergarten teachers, if that makes sense. Families may not know, this family may not know that you had that previous session with 10 other students. They, they see a teacher that's in the session with 10 or 12 students, mm -hmm. though the teacher may teach the lesson twice. And the reason why we were teaching it more than once during the day is so that, that that teacher could accurately listen to the students, receive feedback to the students, and make sure there were no students on the Zoom that were, were tuning out. I mean, even as adults, when we have multiple students on the Zoom, adults on the Zoom, we, we were making sure all students were engaged. Okay, I know y'all are a great district and, and do a lot. Um, do you plan to provide training for those virtual teachers over the summer? What does that look like to prepare them? And I know most of them probably did it this year too, um, but hopefully we learn from the year and continue to grow. On the elementary level, all of my teachers who will teach virtual for next year have on-site experience and they have this year in virtual experience. 
we have already planned some training for the summer. Uh, we have Florida Virtual um, looked into the, some of the training they have that's not specifically geared to the Florida Virtual curriculum, but to digital learning and online teaching. We have also looked at some professional development with Solution Tree uh, to provide virtual teachers um, some, de some dedicated professional development solely for virtual teaching. Um, we're also looking into a, a parent training plan because our parents are our learning coaches and our partners, especially in elementary in this process. So we have already planned parent orientation, parent training, and hopefully to provide a monthly session for our parents as we learn more as we go along to help parents out too. And Dr. Moore, uh, I'd like to address your original question just a little bit further based on some of the feedback that we've received from uh, the teachers is that they have shared with us that they actually feel like that they might um, be able to provide even better tier one instruction with those students than they might with a regular class size because they do have the ability to break those groups down into smaller groups to provide the tier one instruction um, whereas whereas that it's a little bit more difficult to do that in the classroom with that smaller group size. Okay, thank you. I really, um, I really do like the, the idea of the parent training because I know, especially at those lower grade levels, it takes a lot of parent guardian and whoever is with the student hands on. Um, as far as high school goes, it sounds like so you'll have teachers doing that dual role. Will they be separated? Will they be teaching? Um, that dual role at the same time in person and online, or will you all be able to separate out your classes? At the secondary level, they will be teaching separately. So if they are on campus, they're teaching on campus fully. And if they are doing their virtual part, it will be totally the, just the virtual. So they won't be doing anything both. Will students be limited to certain courses or any course that you offer in person be virtually provided. There will be some of the, uh, the electives we're, we're looking through those. Uh, and so, but to have every course op opportunity uh, is not available, but we do have some students who will choose to be on campus and will not be 100% virtual for some of those as well. Okay, so you will allow students to do that hybrid model and participate in extracurriculars and all of those things. Okay. Yes, ma'am. They have the ability to, it's kind of a cherry picking at the high school level where they can, they really can uh, shape their own learning. That's kind of our tagline for the high school is, you know, students shaping their own learning. And so they really are parents and students are able to do that. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about how you came up with the numbers of on the 6-8 six, six, of, of 200 and the 9-12 of 300 um, for a teaching load for a teacher? Sorry, my technology is a little wonky today. Um, we looked at lots of research. Uh, we talked to teachers. We This is our first year to have actual Rogers Public School teachers that are teaching our students. We, we had a third party provider that also provided the teaching piece prior to this. And so we um, looked at a lot of research. Some of our teachers that tutored for us um, had lots of conversations with them about what they felt like teachers could handle as far as being facilitators of a third party curriculum. And um, those are the those are the ways we we came up with those numbers, those two items really. This part of, of the um, application, I think, is probably the, the part that stands out to me as most concerning because you're, you're, you're going to expect those teachers to build relationships because we've already talked about that. Um, in your plan, you talked about uh, a good percentage of it is going to be asynchronous, but some synchronous lessons will be required. 
Uh, there's another place that talks about doing small group instruction. Uh, another place talks about uh, after a PLC pulling in students to, to work on interventions for, for those. And then, um, then another place it talks about uh, making sure that they hear those students read aloud at some point. Uh, and so it just seems like that there's, it goes on and on about what the expectations are. And I, I think about doing that for 200 students and then even spreading it out more to 300 students. Uh, my mind gets boggled with that because I, I think one of the, the presenters said before, uh, what are the numbers that are going to be where our students and teachers can be most successful? And I just, I just, I, I'm, I'm not seeing it with those numbers. Yes, ma'am, and I, I hear your concerns. And right, currently we have 97 sixth through eighth graders and 112 ninth through twelfth graders. So those are our current numbers. Again, as other school districts have mentioned, uh, you know, at one time we were at 3,600 K-12. So the the numbers are drastically lower this year, and we're we're glad to see kids going back to school. Um, I just want to also point out that, uh, like we, I think Dr. Moore mention we will not be having 300 full-time students our students are some of them are taking one virtual class some of them are taking three um, in conjunction with we have very few um, full-time virtual students that that will take up 300 slots if you will i don't know if i said that very well but they're not 300 full-time students. I understand that for electives, but I was thinking about those core teachers, you know, and, and thinking about their numbers, and, and it just gets to be concerning for me to, to think about how a, a teacher is going to be effective and how students are going to develop relationships, and I think that um, we've heard that not only did they develop relationships with that teacher, but they develop relationships with one another. In, uh, during this past year, one of the things that we have seen is um, mental health concerns w with students that, that are virtual. And, and so it just, it just gives me some pause there when we start thinking about those huge, huge numbers. Sound extremely large. Oh, again. Can you hear me? Are you muted? Ms. Osborne, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, those numbers do, I, I'm sure they do sound extremely large and they, and they are uh, fairly big numbers. Um, what I, I think I would just say to that is that when you have students accessing those, the curriculum in the core areas like this, um, there's going to be a large number of students. So the, these teachers have been hired to facilitate, really, and to monitor student progress and student engagement. And so a large number of these students are, while they will need to have contact with that teacher, a relationship somewhat, they're not going to need a whole lot of support. The students that are truly going to need support are probably going to boil down to a fairly manageable number. And those are the ones that as you mentioned, um, at the secondary level that might be asked to um, Zoom synchronously for intervention, um, who we might send a social worker out to help with engagement, um, or that a teacher might be able to develop um, a, um, a two-way communication with that family on a really consistent basis to make sure that the student is getting the support that they need. I know that there'll be opportunities. Um, we have a, we actually have a virtual learning center where if a family has chosen uh, virtual learning for flexibility uh, purposes and are, are feeling safe to come on site, that they could bring their student in for tutoring with the poor teacher. So we feel like we have a lot of supports built in place um, that, you know, maybe no, don't come through through well in the application 
but we are we are very focused on monitoring those students and making sure that they have the tools they need if, if they are not being successful. Sure, and, and just one other thing that I, I would really want to point, point out, one of the things as teachers that sometimes we fight is making sure students don't fall through the cracks. And it's, it's easy to find those students that are, are not doing their work, that are not being uh, uh, my, uh, mastering a standard. But sometimes that student that is doing all of their work, uh, sometimes that, that student that is uh, one of the most compliant that you have in your classroom, that student may be the one that is in most need of attention and most need of help but gets overlooked because nobody sees them uh, in the classroom. And so I just, I just want to be careful here that we, we make sure that all students um, get the attention and, and what they need. I think that leads to, to my question and concern is what process do you have in place then to identify a student who would be successful going into your virtual program before they get started, before they might have issues. We're, we're having to work in tandem here a little bit, sitting in the same room with our sound, I apologize. So we, we have gone through, um, we've worked together to create an application process really um, for our students. and. You know, we, we do understand that, again, as I said, we might be in a transitional year and we have parents who are feel, fearful to send their students to back to on-site learning. Um, and in those cases, we'll work very, very closely with families to make sure their students are successful. But we are reviewing, those parents will fill out the, that application. We're reviewing attendance and academic and engagement records from our previous year. Um, Mrs. Tomasco and Ms. Brown are both are meeting with every student that has in family that has applied that would their data indicates that they might struggle in virtual learning and counseling with that family um, to help determine if virtual is truly the best placement for that child. Um, and so that's that's something we're doing on the front end. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Petridge. I didn't hear what you said. No, I appreciate your I appreciate your answer. Thank you. I know that uh, Dr. Hickson with the Northwest Arkansas Co-op is on today, and I'm wondering what kind of support will you continue to give the districts in your area as they go through this? Are there any plans in place to continue to, to connect with the virtual schools in these districts? Yes, ma'am, we've been, um, actually Rogers was one of the plans. I read um, the four, four of the ones you had on the last state board meeting, Rogers was one of those. And uh, we collaborated quite often, uh, mainly through Google Docs and, and comments. And then I did Zoom with the, the uh, leadership here to um, help them through that process. But um, currently we're in the planning stages. Um, this is new to us. We do not have a digital piece here other than our technology coordinator. And of course, all our specialists here in uh, the co-op have for lack of a better term, pivoted to virtual as well here on training. So we have some class acts here to assist. Um, our digital folks in the area have been working on a, a Zoom almost weekly, I believe. I have it on schedule every Thursday. The coordinators of the Zoom uh, or the virtual um, groups have met and discussed and thrown out ideas. So a lot of the plan pieces you see here from these groups in the Northwest Arkansas have come from that collaborative group. So they're already working amongst themselves and we've been there to support that as well. Okay, thank you. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I noticed you were on today. And I thought it was a great idea that the department included the co-ops in, in this process. I, I like that idea and I hope uh, that will 
that will continue to support our districts. Thank you. I would like to offer thanks to our, our Northwest Arkansas co-op. It has been an invaluable support in the development of this plan. Okay, are there any other questions for the school district specifically or any of the other districts that are still on? I would like to ask Virtual Arkansas some questions. That, that'd be great. John? I'm here. Um, Dr. Moore, or would you be okay if I went ahead and let the school districts that are on off if, unless they wanted to stay? Would that be okay? Certainly, I know everyone is very busy. Okay, so school districts, if you're on, we appreciate you joining us today, but you are uh, excused if you'd like to be excused or you're welcome to stay on and listen to the conversation. John, go ahead. Thank you all for being here today. I know that you have done this for a while. This is not new to you all. I've, I've visited before and seen you in states in schools across the state. Um, but I think as we really dig down into this, um, I want to understand the idea that students are not just using you for one or two courses, but are using you for their whole high school set of courses. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that sort of changes the, the game to me as, as to what your offerings look like. So can you talk to me first about class size, your teachers, and what that looks like? Sure. So our, our uh, teacher loads are, are set. The last, last we checked recently it was at 195. And so there's a lot that goes into why, um, why that is. And it, and it really comes from the experience we have over the years. Um, we're we're a, a system that is built on support um, for the for the teachers and the school districts. And so there's a lot that goes into the decision to to have uh, teachers with around 195 um, average students in, in their courses. We are in a partnership with. Um, state virtual schools around the nation. And so we look at each other's programs and we analyze and, and we, we speak about best practices. And so we take that into consideration. So that is, that is one thing. Another thing is, is we, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we have and require local facilitators. So we do have the teacher, uh, but we also have the local facilitator who's the eyes and the ears um they're locally at the school they are our direct connection so not only is our teacher monitoring these students you have a local f facilitator that, that is monitoring these uh these students as well we have a facilitator coordinator um who trains those so they get annual training and consistent uh point in time as needed training throughout the year and there's constant communication with our facilitator coordinator and the local facilitators to make sure that they have the tools and the strategies in place to also monitor those students and how they're doing. And if there's any issues, they have a direct connection with the administration in case um, interventions are locally needed. Although, you know, we provide our own interventions as well. So there's a, a really close relationship between virtual Arkansas and the local schools, and we work uh, very closely uh, together. That's great, and that certainly makes sense. As I know, um, I know there are a lot of challenges, and I know that that looks different for a student who's taking a virtual Arkansas course while they're in person in a school versus in person at a home. It versus at a home. So, right. what does that does that facilitator? Are they equipped to to handle both of those scenarios? Absolutely, They're, they they are trained. Just just as uh, now the the training is gonna it provides a different component because um, you do have students that are at a distance away from the facilitator, but they but they are trained on how to monitor those students. Our systems are, you know, they they are trained in our system where they can immediately go in and look. Is the student logging in, first of all? How often are they logging in? What's their grade? Uh, what's their progress in the course? And so they, they can see that at 
at any moment of any time of, of the day. I know you all have a hybrid model where there's some asynchronous, some synchronous. Do you have any, are any courses um, competency-based or mastery-based, whatever you were to call it in that sense? So it's, 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 I mean, all of our courses are built according, according to the standards, of course, of Arkansas. And so let, let me go into to that just a little bit because I've, I've heard you talk a lot, a lot about the content. So, so, we, we have a uh, division of Virtual Arkansas that is fully dedicated to um, design development of courses. And so every one of, of our design development team is trained on, on quali the quality matters uh, of online courses, the national standards of online courses, and uh, they're certified course reviewers. And so when we when we build our courses, we're going to build them uh, with with trained individuals. Um, all of our teachers, in fact, anybody who has eyes on our courses, have training with Quality Matters, and so we build. I mean, we build the courses directly to meet the standards um, of of Arkansas for every course that we have, and so students can go through those courses. And it's and it's going to be uh, mastery based, so they can go through the courses. Um, students who have mastered the content, they can progress a little faster than students who haven't mastered particular content. So they can spend more time on what they need to spend uh, more time on. And students who are struggling can can based on their pace spend more time on that content as well. Do you all offer AP courses and career and technical ed courses? Absolutely. So we we have three <clears throat> we have three what we call campuses, and so we have our core campuses, which is going to serve um, and provide courses, typical core courses and and world languages, AP courses. Um, so we have eighteen AP courses that we have available. Yes, and, and we have another uh, we have a CTE campus who provides. Um, I believe we're sitting at about 37 uh, career and technical education courses uh, that we would provide with a teacher. And we also have a concurrent credit campus that offers concurrent credit options as well. Okay, that's great. Um, one thing I, I look at and think through a lot are um, students, two groups of students, students who are struggling and who are coming in well below grade level, and then another group of students who um, are considered special education. Mm -hmm. How do you all um, work with those students? Both of those well, well our, our teachers are going to get a lot of information from those students uh, based on pretest and, and formative assessments that are built into the courses throughout the year. And so and, and one, of the, one of the great features of, of you know, the learning management system is the data analysis tools that, that are available to our teachers. It's, it's amazing what they can drill down and find out about their students and where they're where their weaknesses may lie. And, and so it's a great system for that. Um, as far as the special education, you know, I've been doing this for now six years. Can't recall any time where we've had a major issue with, with any of our special education students. Um, they can receive um, the modifications and, and, and have their needs met, just like those needs can be met at a local district. And so, um, you know, that's sometimes surprising, you know. Uh, we, have, we have blind students in our courses. We have deaf students in our courses. We have every kind of student in our courses, and they are successful. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. I do, I do want to say one thing. This was mentioned earlier, um, and it was about relationships. And, and I really appreciate the thought that, that you all have put into your questions. Um, relationships is extremely important. And that's one of the things that we hear a lot is, you know, this is, this is learning at a distance. And, and, you know, you really, there's no way you can develop that relationship. And, and that is, 
that is just not the case. We develop, our teachers develop wonderful relationships uh, with our students. And we, we specifically teach and train strategies on how um, to develop positive relationships with the students. We want, I mean, if you look at their research, I mean, you ask a student what motivates them. They say, it's, it's, I know that my, my teacher cares for me. So we literally measure that. We, we want to know, do our students know that their teacher cares for them? And, you know, when we first started this venture and when Ms. Swan started this, um, it was innovative. And so we looked at that early and we wanted to, to climb. And so we implemented those strategies, trained our teachers on those strategies, and now we're up um, in, in the mid 90% on our responses from our students to say, yes, my teacher cares for me. And I'm gonna read this because as soon as one of the panel members mentioned relationships, I noticed an email come in from a parent. Um, it's timestamp, I did not plan this. And I wanna read this to you because it, it, it speaks directly to what you said. And I think it's funny that it came in as right when relationships was, was mentioned. So if, you, if you'll humor, humor me, I wanna read this. And this is from, from a parent of one of our students. It says, she didn't know who to contact, so she just sent it to me. She said, I wanna make it known that parents, at least myself, recognize how much added effort Virtual Arkansas has put into program this year. And I'm thankful my daughter was able to be part of the program. She had a great experience this year and found that mo that, that her teachers really strive to, to be helpful and encouraging. Every one of her instructors have remained in frequent contact and I have known exactly what they're doing from week to week. I'm forwarding an email that I received this morning from a teacher to prove that. Even though she's never physically been in her presence, my daughter has really enjoyed her class and talks a lot about this teacher's kindness and obvious love for what she does. Kudos to your faculty and staff, and thank you for supporting my child in every way. And so that, that is what we try to get um, with all of our parents. That's, that's the feeling that we want all of our students to have and all of our parents. So, um, so I'm going to kind of loop this back to a question that Nathan you asked earlier on. Um, oh, my bad. Okay. One time. That's your warning. <laughs> okay. We're, we're on the home stretch here. Okay. Um, when um, early on, Dr. Moore asked about, um, you know, how did we get to large class size and um, in our rules and how did that become for digital? And I, I don't know the exact answer, but D Kathy Swan is on here who did, was kind of our pioneer in our state for virtual learning, um, did launch Virtual Arkansas, which I don't know if everybody on the Zoom recognizes, was a state support, it came from the Department of Education project. Um, you know, I think in the early stages, it was six to eight million dollars, Kathy, is that right? Um, and over time, the, the money has changed throughout the year and districts now pay um, a consortium fee and they pay for their classes and things like that, but there's still a partnership there. Kathy, can you speak, and even maybe John, but Kathy, you might be the one, talk about the what national standards for class size or teaching load and, and maybe how that came to be a large class instruction. Is that an okay question, Dr. Moore? Is that kind of what you were asking earlier? Okay. Kathy, can you address that? Sure, thank you, and thank you for letting me be here today. Um, good morning, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. I always have to look in Zooms because you're in Zooms all day. The large um, group came about because of the flexibility that is uh, provided in a virtual environment that we don't really see in a fixed classroom environment. And so when you think about innovation, the large group came from, maybe you have a medical model of teaching where you have four teachers and one is an assessment expert. And one is that person on the camera, that, that face of the course. And maybe you have someone who um, is an intervention expert. And maybe there's three teachers serving three or 400 students. Um, it never was intended to say one teacher for 600 students. It was intended to allow for innovation and give um, 
options for content providers, for for profit providers, for school districts, for agencies to innovate within that and find their sweet spot. Find what works for them where that teacher is feeling very, very supported and impacting as many children as they can, but then also every child succeeding and every family being, feeling supported. So in those early conversations, it was really difficult to say, here's the number. This is the number because there's so many different approaches. You may have two teachers, one para, two teachers, two para. So um, it was left open-ended to allow for innovation. And hopefully the vision at that point of the meeting that was held right before I came on board was that they wanted to allow and hopefully get to the medical model of teaching, which was all this support around all of these, stu these students and to allow for that to be efficient and effective. So that's where that came from and why it was added in um, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And so since that time, what's amazing to me is we have more powerful digital tools than we had then. So now the teacher does kind of have a medical model of teaching. So uh, Mr. Ashworth alluded to the content. The content is designed, um, can be designed for it to automatically send a student into a pathway based on what they put into the system. So it's almost like there's a paraprofessional there, a virtual para, um, that when that student is not doing well in that type of learning method or, or model, they can automatically by the system be directed into a whole nother way of learning that same content. So there's kind of another support person there in the way that the content is developed. Then you layer on top of that, these powerful progress monitoring tools that quite honestly, you can log in every morning and see your entire class and they will have a green, a yellow or a red based on how they did the day before. So every morning you get this, this list and you go, oh green, I'm reaching out to them. You can even set automated responses from you that are very personal if they did well to say, good job parents, keep going here are some extra resources for you if you wanna dive deeper. Then you say, okay, here Parapro, co-teacher, these yellow students, we gotta go in. We gotta go in today and intervene with them right now. And that's where you set up your small groups. And then if you have red students, then you need to be um, calling out the EMT and calling out the supports and getting that student rallied up and around around that family. So you, you really have the medical model of teaching now because of technology, because you do have that classroom teacher, but you also have that support for them in the way that the content is designed to allow for, for uh, additional methods of teaching and then that progress monitoring piece. It was also thought about that if this was a um, provider to home experience, then there was also another adult that was gonna be expected to be highly trained as a coach or facilitator or support. And they are in the home with that child. So there's a whole nother para or a whole nother set of hands and eyes and ears to help that student that's highly trained by the provider or the school district. So you really do have all these hands around these students where you could have a potentially six people looking in and supporting that student with this medical model. So if you limit the number, it was just, just try not to, to, to squelch innovation. So I hope that that provides a little bit of uh, insight into that and then, and how the whole teaching load, thinking about the teaching load of a, fixed classroom teacher really does not quantify to a classroom load of a virtual teacher because of all of the, the dashboards and resources. It almost makes teachers super or superheroes anyway, but it gives them all these tools to actually really become, have this dashboard and be able to jump in and intervene with this one student or these two students point in time. And so in, in the medical model, um, that was kind of the vision of, of allowing for the larger groups. Stacy, I hope that answers the question or Dr. Moore provides some insight as to the history. That is helpful, thank you. In those early conversations and now, were there conversations about certain courses, you know, more lending themselves to that model and certain courses not? In, in my mind, a high school ELA, we have, um, in my opinion, a writing gap in the state where students need more intensive writing instruction and that's hard to do with 195 in your class. Were those conversations existed and, and what does that evolving conversation look like? 
the conversation existed and the conversation still goes on as every provider is trying to determine their when I say provider that could be a school district it be a co-op whoever is providing the digital instruction goes on to find that sweet spot you know that we're talking about that spot where okay this course may not can take that many students so then if you start to look at what student you know how many students um, can a student succeed with 10 in their class size or 20 in their class size so it really is dependent upon the student the course the quality of the teacher so that's why it's really left up to the educators to make those decisions the way that it is made it left up to them to make those in the brick and mortar you know what's the best teacher for me to put here how many students do I really need to put here I know I can have 30 but maybe they just need 20 so it was provided to leave some flexibility like I said for the districts or the provider to do what they needed to do uh, for the student and the teacher thank you Any other questions for John or Kathy? I'm just curious, what is our current enrollment in virtual Arkansas? So we go by we go by semester enrollments. And so for this year, so you can split this as essentially in half. So this semester it's gonna be in the 18,500 range. For the year it will be it would be somewhere in the 38,000 range for the for the year. Again, semester, semester. John, is that by course? You have 18,000 students enrolled in a cor single course, or do you have 18,000 individual 18, students? 18,000 18, enrollments. And so, so for, I don't have the data for uh, this semester for the first semester. We typically, um, uh, we, we track the number of enrollments per student. And typically we have 1.2 pre-COVID, 1.2 enrollments per student. Uh, this year we're at 1.8, at least we were at first semester. And just to tag along to that, our districts, do they reimburse you per student or per course? It's per enrollment. Per enrollment, and is that a fixed cross? Fixed cost it's, across the state? It's not fixed, uh, it's not fixed across. It ranges between 60 and $100 per half unit. We do have one course, which is uh, our drone course because of the software, it's $120 per half unit. Um, but uh, most of the electives you're gonna find at the lower end, at the 60 or $80, the, the, um, uh, the core classes that are required for graduation are gonna be at the $100 range. Thank you. Okay. Um wanted to one of the other big kind of conversation pieces that i know that we needed to talk about today was um, the number of years i know there was a lot of conversation about that before and we've had internal conversation here at the department too i'm going to ask deb to come up and kind of tell you kind of where the department's falling on that right now and just kind of our thoughts around that thank you um you've known me a long time and there's two things you know about me i like a plan and then i want data so uh, we've brought you very thoughtful, committed plans. And so what I would ask you to do is to consider approving these um, applications for a minimum of three years, and here's why. For the 21-22 school year, that will be the baseline for these applications to be implemented. Now, they've all told you they've learned a lot, but they need to implement the plan that is written and presented. The data then will be based on the 22 summative assessment and we won't have that ready to give to you till about December, January, somewhere in there. We'll have to run ESSA Index and Perkins data and then Dr. Arola um, is committed to running the data to match with the digital learning plans. The next year, um, they will implement again and we'll have the second year of data. So if you give them a three year timeline, that gives you two years of data based on their written plan. And that helps you to make a real data driven decision. Thank you. And okay. if I may, Dad, before you go. I, well, I just want to weigh in on that and reinforce uh, what Ms. Kaufman said. 
there have been a lot of internal conversations about this, and uh, uh, you know, some of them uh, maybe were tinged with a little conflict, uh, uh, which is not a bad thing, because uh, we we really, I mean, I hope y'all know we dig deep on, on this stuff. Um, we've been since before I got here. I mean, this, these are the kinds of programs we have been encouraging because we, we knew, we being educators, uh, state leaders, others, we knew innovation uh, was coming and we knew distance learning was part of it. I mean, Arkansas is no stranger to it. We've been doing it all the way back uh, to the, the uh, compressed interactive video. I mean, that, that's, you know, the technology has, has drastically shifted uh, over the years, and, and now it's more affordable. It's not only more affordable for districts, it's more affordable for families. And, and we've been trying to set up good systems, good delivery systems for this for a long time. And, uh, and I know it's, it's hard because when you get to this point, and, and it's like there's wide scale adoption of what we've been saying we wanted folks to try. And so that's the point where internally we struggled, and I know you as board members struggle as well, about uh, giving that final stamp of, uh, yes, we're okay with this. Um, but I, what Deb said was, was critically important. Uh, we, we have the plans, and one thing that we have really stressed uh, since when it comes to ESSA, when it comes to any plan that we ask for, it's not a static document that sits on a shelf. If districts see things that are going on that they need to make adjustments, we expect them to make the adjustments and to let us help them when they need our help to do that. So that's no different here. I mean, if they see something happening that isn't quite the way they expected, we want them to let us know so we can help them make, make the changes. Um, but without three years, then you know, there's very real possibility that a year from now, these folks that have been spending a lot of time reviewing these plans, we're going to have to do it again in some way uh, to, to be able to bring back another 1240 waiver request. So we just to, to say a lot, use a lot of words for me to ask you, uh, please consider at least the three years that Ms. Kaufman mentioned. Uh, and. Uh, Obviously, not something you have to decide today, but in the coming weeks, uh, as we have more of these plans, just something that really would ask you to consider before we make the final decisions. Cut off, Dr. Moore. So sorry about that, Sarah. No, you, but thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, I appreciate it. I have. I've had an ongoing concern with Act 1240 waivers when districts come to renew, they are not showing us data that's student focused. So in three years, if this were to occur, it, will this be an evaluation by Dr. Arola or will, will it be self-reported by districts like we have right now? Our plan is to bring you a yearly report. Okay. So made by all, not by districts. Yes, we'll we'll bring you we'll bring you whatever we can bring to you that uh, doesn't have a restricted value, mm -hmm. but um, we'll bring you everything that we have um, as soon as we have it because we all want to monitor this. We want to monitor this along the way. We want to know the number of students in attendance and participation. We want to know, as a Secretary Key said, we want to know when it's working right. We want to know when it's not working as well. How do we adjust? Um, I think the point here is we're trying to serve kids, so we need to know. So we'll bring you everything we have. Thank you. There were a couple of these these plans that we had today that I would feel very comfortable with with that. That they were good plans, and and I feel comfortable in. There are a couple that didn't, I, it just gives me some pause, but you know, and I think Dr. Moore said it very well. You know, we've had some self-reporting districts on 1240 waivers, and we're just not really getting to what I would think the meat of whether a, a waiver would be effective or not. You know, if we could have some 
in-depth reporting, and especially I think y'all you, are already looking at some of the risk factors on, on some of these districts and, and looking at that and, and making sure that we had some, some monitoring uh, of, of these that, that we feel like are, are on shaky ground. You know, I'll just be honest, I, I felt a couple of these were, were not, well, I won't go there, but anyway, it just, you, you, just making sure that we had monitoring and then the good reporting that, that you know, uh, I think from, from the department level, making sure that we were looking at, you know, how, how not only are we looking at student data and we're looking at uh, are our students being affected, but then also looking at teachers also. Uh, and, and, you know, are our teachers being effective? Are they burning out? What's happening at the teacher level also there? If I may comment too, um, I, I agree with you, and I agree with you on um, previous 1240s and the reports, and that was even something um, that we tried to do a little bit of shifting on in the last batch of 1240s that were not digital applications. Um, when they were coming back for renewals, we were really trying to dig into, and we've even changed our internal process here at the department. We were trying to dig into whether or not they had data to support the renewal of the 1240. In fact, some of the districts um, they never got to, as far as the state board, but they asked for waivers that they had had previously. And when we started really digging in, they didn't use them. And we said, we, we were not gonna recommend it if you didn't use it, well, we're not, why would we do that? On some of them, we said, um, we need more of your data, you didn't explain this. And we, had to, we asked them to give us more information because we didn't feel like they had enough to support. Um, that was one of the reasons for one of the districts specifically on um, teacher licensure we only recommended one year. That was not what they had come to us with and was, they were not requesting that. Now they could have come to you and asked for more than that, but in our working with them, we felt like the one year, because we felt like we had work there to do. So I agree with everything you've said. Um, and so that was one of the pieces on our internal process that we're trying to shift. So hopefully we can, when we're bringing the waivers to you, there's a little bit more with that. Um, the 150, district applications, again, not every one of those we're gonna come to you and say we recommend it. You will see all 150 of them at some point because we're required to bring them to you, but the department may still have concerns about some of them and may not make a recommendation. And then again, you as a board we could dig in and determine whether or not you're comfortable with them or not. Um, on the ones you heard about today, I just wanted to note that um, the West Side Johnson County Guy Center, just in our notes, we had already flagged for monitoring the reading part in the early grades and going back and following up with that and determining whether or not um, the way that they were approaching the science of reading and the materials, like how did that work? That was something we'd already noted. Um, on the Rogers application, the class size piece, we noted that. So while we're talking about how we're gonna do our monitoring for next year, I don't have the complete rollout plan for you today. It's gonna to be based on how we've noted these, di these diff different risk levels at the different districts and what things are standing out. And then, um, for example, on the literacy part, that most likely will be our literacy team who normally is not in monitoring. But in this case, it would make sense for them to do that. Um, on areas where we feel like there was really high large numbers of teachers and ratios, that may be our teacher effectiveness unit who normally doesn't monitor. Um, you know, site visits looking for different things than we've normally looked for. So again, we're building this airplane as far as the monitoring piece at the same time we're flying. Um, but at the same time, I think we're trying to be personalized with our mo monitoring based on the needs we're seeing that are coming out of the, of the schools. Um, so that's just something else I wanted to kind of put out there today. Another comment I wanted to make, um, because there were a couple of questions around this as far as screening and assessment. So state law still applies. You know, there is a requirement for screening students with dyslexia. There is a requirement for assessment. Um, that still is the district's responsibility, whether the student's virtual or on site. And so there has to be a plan for that. Um, and so in some of the cases with some of the applications you've seen, the student will be brought on site and they'll be screened. On some of them, they'll do virtual screening. On some of them, the co-op will take on that responsibility. It depends on the application. 
but state assessment piece is still there. Accountability is still there. Um, so what that school's supposed to be offering and all those wraparound services, they're just, those are still there. Um, so I just wanted to kind of clarify that part as well. Um, is, there any is there any questions about any waivers or clarifications that y'all need on waivers? Because if so, I want to bring Mary Claire up and let her ask and answer any questions. Not, not specifically on maybe a specific waiver, but one of the things uh, we heard from Virtual Arkansas, based on their experience in the past and doing this for several years and, and working, and they, they have all the different layers of support um, built in, they're looking at a class teaching load of 195. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you get an application where it goes over about that level, could you maybe give the district some guidance or pushback or whatever you need to do to, to say, what research have you done that shows that a teacher can be effective when you go over that amount? Okay. And, 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 you know, because I know you're going through these applications very thoroughly, and, and I, I want to again say how much I appreciate the work that y'all put in on going through all of these and, and uh, working with districts to make sure they have good plans. But and maybe you we can do yeah, some conversations we, we will, on the front end on that. We can go back and review any of them that show a size over that and go mm -hmm. back and ask more questions around that and yeah. even pull those to the side um, for a definite, have them at the board meeting to be able to ask some of those clarifying questions about what are the supports. So that would that be? Yeah. Is there anything that you, so I think conversation needs to occur on what, what about moving forward and how you as a board would like to see us present these to you as we move forward. Are you comfortable with us bringing them in batches in an expedited fashion like we talked about? Or do you feel like we need to have just the districts that are over 190 on there or ones that you pull out? I, I want to be able to. I want to make this effective and efficient, but at the same time, I want you to have confidence in, in what you and decisions you have to make. So, is there any discussion around that from the board? Would it be possible? I'm good, um, kind of bulk passing them. But would it be possible since we get the agenda? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Would it be possible since we get the agenda ten days beforehand if we want a district to be on the call? to ask them questions. So, you know, maybe you give us 10 and we say, hey, can we just have these two districts available for the call? Yes, ma'am. If we get a batch, could we get, you know, if we get a batch of 50 three days ahead of time, I mean, we can't, can't do it. we can't do it. You know, we're gonna have to have, if you're gonna give us a large batch, we need time to be able to, to read and, and because, it, you know, one of these was 60 pages, the others are 30. I mean, it takes time to go through them and not get overwhelmed by just, you know, you forget what you're reading, so. Okay. Won't these have to be pretty pretty large batches or to get moving on these as far as like time timeline or, or thinking of? You know, yeah, well, getting so right now, Deb, how many do we, or Tally, how many do we actually have ready for next Thursday at this point? Four? additional for plus the 10 we just had so if 14 are we going to have any more this afternoon so we're waiting on some some, some so dr pride here in learning services i'm telling you it's just falling apart what, what, what are we going to do um they have probably some of the the, the larger sections as feedback and and digging into and so right now we're in a process right now we're we, we've reviewed a lot and we're waiting for some feedback and they're re-reviewing. Um, so we will try to get a, as many applications as we can uploaded for you by tomorrow and won't add any more after tomorrow for next Thursday's meeting. Would that work? So we'll get as many that we can by the end of tomorrow uploaded for you to be able to review for next Thursday. And then if you guys could get through and look at those and give me notice um, maybe by Tuesday if there's one that's kind of flagging for you and we will go through them as well and look for the high numbers. Um, what we might have to do in between, so that and then the next board meeting we'll have a batch on there and then we'll probably need to have another meeting at some point with another batch. I mean we'll probably have to do a couple of these but I think we can get to a point where we can do them virtually and we can do, if, if that's the only thing we're doing on there, we can do it batch by batch and have those districts on there. Does that sound like a plan? Thank you. One more question there. In thinking about Ms. Newton's question, are we able to put qualifiers around a waiver? So for instance, we can say, 
you can, you know, we'll grant, and I know it's a small percentage of asking for that class size waiver, but we'll grant the class size waiver, but for no more than five over at the elementary levels, no more than 195. Is that a, like a qualifier we can do? Yes, so the board has a lot of flexibility in terms of putting limits on the waiver, so you can put that on there. One thing to, you'll have to have some conversation with them because some of the applicants, if you make a restriction that isn't in line with how they wanna do their program, they might not be able to move forward with their program, but that's a discussion you can have with the, the individual applicants. But yes, you can, you have the authority to put limits on waivers like that. And also, um, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but you have the authority at any time if during the monitoring of the department or if you start hearing about a particular program to call a school in to review their waivers, change their waivers, revoke, modify, whatever you wanna do. So um, I think that that gives you a lot of control over the waivers moving forward. Thank you. And the department, as we're monitoring, if we think there's an issue, we can, can we ask them to come forward, Commissioner, or does it, we just notify the board that we'd like them to call somebody in? How does that work? Is that a Mary Kay question? So when we're monitoring. So what would happen is we would present the information to the board and the board would vote to call them in. Um, then we give notice and the law just changed on that, so we've gotta give notice to the board president and the superintendent, 15 days notice in writing and then you can have a hearing in front of the board. And this just might be as we move forward with this the next year that we have some intentional planning of different schools, having them come in on Fridays during reports and doing updates throughout the year as well. Okay. Um, that's all the things I had on my list for you today, but what, are, what topics do you have that you wanna to continue to discuss? Ms. Smith, I do have a, a question about the district. We've already passed one district's plan, but we only passed it for the one year. So if we look at the minimum three-year recommendation, is there any way to go back and uh, amend that? So that same district presented their charter um, this last week, and they actually got three years on their charter. So he, he, would, look, he would actually love for you guys to do that. I'll let Mary Claire. So all you would need to do is rescind your action from last, was it last week? It feels like it was a year ago. Um, from whenever you approved it, you would rescind your action and then vote um, to approve for three years. Okay, so we can do that next week then, I guess, okay. One, one other thing that, that I would like is if, if any in the batch are like with the guy Finner. Uh, put together. Uh, put together. Could we on um, those have that actually go ahead and, and ask the co-op people to be on yes. the call? I mean, just go ahead and ask for those because they're the ones that really know what the program is like. Because lots of times the district are not gonna have the answers, but the, but the co-op will. Yes, we will do that. So co-ops will automatically be on. Yes. And we'll try to group all the districts with them at the same time. Okay. Okay. Because right now you've seen them coming through as singletons as we're approving them and we'll try to batch those. I did have one more question. The consortiums was very interesting to me. Are you seeing that pattern with a lot of the other, uh, or do you anticipate seeing that pattern with other applications coming in that there are going to be consortiums, uh, schools joining in with a consortium approach? So at this time, so we have 15 educational cooperatives in the state. Um, one, two, three, four, five, Six of them have a consortium with their districts. Um, one, we have a tri-county co-op, which we've got three of the educational cooperatives. They've come together to form one. So, um, as, so we've got about seven of them statewide working with districts in their area. But most of the districts that they're working with are those smaller districts. Um, so today, you know, you heard Texarkana had a really robust plan of principal. Um, they were a larger district. And so what you see in the areas of the cooperatives, they're really pulling from many small districts kind of coming together and kind of having that coordinator, which is kind of like a principal position and, and some of those things. So yeah, we, we, we are seeing those. Um, 
some are larger than others. Guy Fenter is the largest group with the most districts. Um, the second one on that would be um, Arkansas River, which was um, Miss Swan, who you heard from earlier. Oh, and the, and the tri co op one, too. I'm just making stuff up here. That's the one that had three different co ops involved where they were partnering. Thank you. Arkansas River, they, they had several that were not member districts, yes. right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they said the six were not member districts. And part of the reason on that is, um, and I'm not sure if Kathy's on here anymore or not. Kathy, are you still on here? I don't, I don't think she is. Um, you know, Kathy's, his, that's her background, and she's their director. And she rolled out kind of a plan, especially with um, the younger grades. Um, and offered that to all the other co-ops if they wanted to kind of partner up with her on that. Okay, that's all we have unless you guys have something. I just wanted to end on uh, just saying that we appreciate all of the, the work that has gone into um, going over these. It's, it's a phenomenal amount. So we definitely appreciate all the work that has gone into it and the districts that have um, applied and those that have been on the call today, we appreciate you taking time to um, help us uh, with some questions and give us clarity. Um, and I just wanna go back and hit on something that we kind of hit all day, which is talking about relationships. And that's what we have to keep the focus on. We are trying to build and strengthen relationships with our students, with our teachers, uh, with our community members for the reason and for the purpose of making sure our students get the best education. So however we need to do, whatever we need to do to develop those relationships, um, whether it's gathering data, it's, it's all about communication and figuring out new and innovative ways to communicate. Uh, relationships take work. It's, it's a bit easier to have a, um, a relationship with someone who's in town and someone that you can get in touch with really easily. It takes a <coughs> lot more work when you have, for uh, example, a uh, bi-coastal relationship. It can work. It can work if you have a long distance relationship. Um, however, it takes a lot of creativity, a lot of work, um, and a lot of communication and a lot of sharing information to make it work efficiently. And we need to think of that in the same way for our students. Um, digitally, that's long distance. Well, that's like a long distance relationship. And we've gotta make sure that, um, you know, our group size is where it needs to be. We don't have too many people in between those relationships. So I just appreciate all of the work that has gone into um, getting this information and helping us make the best decision for our students. So we appreciate your time today. Thank you. And with that, we're done. Well done, team. Thank you.